I was grabbing a book out of my locker when some guy's shout startled me. Hey everyone, the results are over here! Oh, <laughs> it's just the results of the Mind Buzz, our annual high school general knowledge competition. People, what's the rush? Don't we all know what it'll be like already? See, nothing's changed. That's my name, there, the first place of Willowmere High, as always. And of course, what came along with it were endless praises from everyone. Way to go, Millie, you're our school superhero. Oh my gosh, you're amazing, I'm so jealous of you. Yep. Hi, I'm Millie, the girl who always aces every school contest and is therefore adored by the other students, all the teachers, and the principal. Later that day, as soon as I stepped out of art class, Alice, my excitable best friend, jumped out of nowhere and squealed out, I just found this really cool place. We have to go there right now. No chance. I have the final round of the blast from the past contest tomorrow. I mean, history is my forte, so I'm sure to win, but I still want to cram in some last minute studying. Come on, we all know you'll win anyway. You even said that yourself. So let's just hang out for a little, please. Fine, but only cause I'm an amazing friend. Hmm, okay, I have to admit, this place was actually kind of cool. It's an adorable cafe hidden at the end of a street corner. But wait a minute, what's up with that sticker on the window? Isn't that the Leafmore High School symbol? No way we're setting foot in that taboo place. I tried tugging on Alice's arm and gesturing for us to leave, but she stood her ground and replied, Come on, Millie, we have to try their croissants. All the food bloggers are talking about it. But this is Leafmore's territory. Look! So? It's not like anyone will recognize us. Before I could comprehend what was happening, she dragged me inside. Oh well, it seems like we've gone too far to draw back, so I may as well sample what this place has to offer. Why was our order taking so long? And what was with Alice? Ugh, how many selfies did one girl need to take? I was clenching my fist to stop myself from anxiously fidgeting when two boys walked towards our table. Hey cutie, I've not seen you in here before. What grade are you in? Oh no, how should I answer this question? I quickly turned away, pretending to rummage through my bag to avoid his gaze, but they still didn't leave me alone, as the other guy said, Wait, this girl doesn't seem to be from our school, are you? Oh snap, did he recognize me? My skin turned clammy with nerves and I thought I was gonna throw up. Then suddenly a voice rang out. Sorry I'm late, have you been waiting long? Then he plonked himself down next to us. Seeing that, the two guys left. Phew! But who is this guy? Do we know him? Oh my god, Evan, it's you! Mmm, is that the new Calvin Klein cologne? It smells amazing on you. Huh? Evan? As in, Evan Summers? The top student in Leafmore, aka my biggest competition in tomorrow's contest? To Alice's excitement and my puzzled look, Evan just lightly smiled, then got up to leave. <sighs> He's indeed a cold angel. What? All he was to me was arrogant. You're probably wondering what the deal between Willowmere and Leafmore is, right? They're the two biggest high schools in this town, but like the same poles of magnets, they repel each other. The two schools have been rivals since forever, competing with each other from academic achievements to collective activities. In competitions organized by the town, such as marathons, Halloween decorations, or even cooking contests. And of course, the students from both schools despise each other so much that we have boundaries in town. For example, this cafe is only for Leafmore students, while only Willowmere students are allowed in that bookstore. Breaking these rules could lead to outright carnage. The schools take this super seriously. Hence, there's even a rule saying we can't interact with each other. And dating is a real no-no. You see, as the top student in Willowmere, I can't let anyone find out I've stepped foot in Leafmore territory, as if they do, my life won't be worth living. And also, because of my number one position, I have a responsibility to help my school win as many prizes as possible. And this history contest is no exception. I anxiously waited for the host to announce the results. And the last 20 points go to Leafmore High School, which makes them the winners of today's contest. From the other side of the hall, the Leafmore students erupted into applause, and they all charged at Evan and hugged him. Seeing the arrogant Evan with a triumphant face made me even more upset. Congratulations, you were amazing! Alice, we lost! Only by five points! 
Second place is still good, but it was me who was defeated by that Evan. Poor Alice is still trying to keep her shy smile at me. I didn't want to take it out on her either, so I quickly left. The next day I was walking along the school corridor, minding my own business, when I passed a group of students gossiping about me. <sighs> she definitely lost the quiz on purpose. Yeah, her question was so easy. Everyone knows that the first US dollar was printed in 1862. Why were they saying such mean things about me? I tried my best to ignore their jibes and distract myself with my phone, but what is this? Someone had uploaded a picture of me, Alice, and Evan all sitting together in that cafe the other day. Oh no. And worse still, from this angle, we all looked kind of close. Furious, I went to leave, but Polly, this annoying girl, blocked my way and mocked me. Millie, if you don't like this place, you could have transferred schools. Losing to leave more on purpose is just embarrassing. I did no such thing. Not that it's any of your business. I hurried away from her and her smirking friends. The problem is, it seemed like the entire school had seen that picture and concluded that I'm a traitor. At least things couldn't get any worse, right? Wrong. My bad luck continued when I got my English Lit essay back. A B minus. This can't be right. I never get anything lower than an A. Ever. I was checking through my test when suddenly there was an announcement on the speaker asking me to come to the principal's office. Millie, you're usually such an excellent student, but I've received some unpleasant news about you recently, and your grades are slipping significantly. I could only stare down at the floor and mumbled, I'm really sorry. I've never been scolded by the principal before. This was the worst day of my life. Miss Garcia was silent for a moment before she continued. However, I still have faith in you so I'm giving you one last chance to prove yourself. The town's hosting a Rube Goldberg machine camp and our school must win. Can you make that happen, Millie? I forced a smile and nodded. No problem, ma'am. The first prize will be ours. Trust me. This is my chance to show everyone that I'm devoted to this school. However, there's one teensy tiny problem. Physics is not my forte. It's all right. I just got to do my best, right? I spent the next two weeks planning, researching, and testing out ideas with my group. We finally managed to create the perfect Rude Goldberg machine. It includes 15 genius steps to complete the final task. We're surely going to secure all these bonus points. Finally, the camp weekend arrived, and I was super stoked to show off my team's entry. Tomorrow will be it. I'll get Willowmere's name back on top again. Then suddenly, Miss Garcia tapped my shoulder and gestured me over to an empty corner and worriedly said, Leafmore's machine is highly praised by the judges. At this rate, they're most likely to win, and that'll mean humiliation for us. Don't worry, I'm trying my best. We'll add some extra magnets and springs. It's no use. The only way we'll win over Leafmore is if their entry encounters problems. She sighed, then turned to leave. Feeling deflated, I stared down at my feet. That's when I saw a pocket knife, with Miss Garcia's name printed on it, lying on the ground. I picked it up and called out, Miss, you dropped your knife! But Miss Garcia didn't stop walking or turn back, and just did a snipping gesture with her fingers. Could it be that Miss Garcia meant... Yep, definitely. That's the only way. So that night, I waited until everyone else was asleep, then I snuck into the gallery and cut a piece of wire holding the light bulb of Leafmore's model. That should be enough. I was about to leave the room when suddenly the lights came on. What are you doing here? I... I... You just did this, didn't you? Um... Yeah? So what? Go ahead, tell on me if you want. This is all so meaningless. Then he sat down and started fixing his model. Huh? What's meaningless? Good God, he's so full of himself. Fine then. Just you wait, Evan. I'll beat you with my own talent. Let's see if you'll still be Mr. Arrogant then. It was my team's turn, and for the first three steps, the Rube Goldberg machine worked quite smoothly. But when it came to the fourth step, suddenly the wooden slide collapsed, causing the marble to fall to the ground and the machine to stop working. We all stared at each other in panic. No, 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 this couldn't be happening. We tested it many times this morning and it had worked perfectly fine. I rushed over to check what was wrong with the machine, 
but I struggled and couldn't find a way to fix it, when suddenly a voice said, Let me see. I looked up. It was Evan. I stepped aside to make room for him, when suddenly Ms. Garcia appeared. I see what's happened here. Clearly, Leafmore High knew the only way they'd win was by sabotaging the best entry. The whole hall started to stir, but I felt my skin prickle with unease. I didn't think this was Leafmore's doing. Look at Evan. He didn't even bother telling the judges about last night's incident. Immediately after that, Leafmore's principal, Miss Harris, said, Miss Garcia, you can't go around accusing us without proof. Clearly, you're the one who feels the need for underhand tactics to win, not us. Then she held out her phone and circled the crowd so everyone could see. I gasped in shock. There on the screen was a picture of me standing next to Leafmore's model with a knife. Miss Harris continued. Seeing as we managed to fix it in time, we decided not to mention anything else about it. But then you dared to accuse us. The crowd glared and tutted at me, and I longed for the floor to swallow me whole. I put blood, sweat, and tears into creating our model, and now people just thought I was a cheat. The worst part was they were right. I was one. The jury went off to discuss this. Then they announced their conclusion. Willowmere had been disqualified. Immediately, Mrs. Garcia piped in. This is hardly fair. That was the action of one individual, not the whole group. I assure you that Millie is no longer on the team, so let my school continue to compete without her. I froze in shock. How could Miss Garcia do this to me? It had been all her idea, hadn't it? She'd given me the knife. The realization of what just happened hit me and I fell to my knees and burst into tears. All that hard work and for nothing. Even Alice hugging me in comfort didn't release me from my gut-wrenching, sinking feeling. Then to my surprise, Evan said, Mrs. Garcia, can you explain why I found this knife with your name engraved on it next to our model? He raised the knife up for everyone to see. Oops, in all the stress of last night, I must have dropped it. Miss Garcia turned ghostly pale and everyone started to buzz about it. I can't believe you colluded with your students to do this. You're no different from her. Last night, Miss Harris instructed me to tamper with Willowmere's model, but I refused. As if we win, I wanted it to be fairly. The whole hall once again began to stir and copped on amazed as Evan continued. I'm so tired of the petty feud between our schools. It's so dumb and meaningless. The jury went off to discuss this further and came back with a new announcement. Both schools were disqualified. It's shameful. But, well, it's for the best. We really don't deserve to be here. Oh boy, that sure was eventful. The scandal between the two schools was hot gossip in the town for days. They even brought it up at the monthly town meeting. That's when the truth came out that Ms. Garcia and Ms. Harris had history. They were in the same year at school and were fiercely competitive against each other. So years later, when both of them became principals of the two schools, began this whole feud war. In the end, both principals were forced to leave their positions. So now what? Well, there aren't any dumb rules about where I can go anymore, which is good, because I actually really like it here. I've learned my lesson, and I'm never going to let anyone pressure me into cheating ever again. Peace has returned to school life, and it feels good. Oh, and as for Evan, I'm actually studying with him right now for our next Blast from the Past quiz. Only this time, I'm definitely going to beat him. Really? You're from Korea? No way! You sound just like a native speaker. Richard jumped up in surprise as I told him I came from South Korea. Yeah, I'm 100% Korean! I answered him giggling. <laughs> I had spent hours every day practicing my English. Guess it has paid off. But that was six years ago already. I'm Jenny, by the way, and I'm Korean. At the time I was 21, I joined an online English speaking club where I first met Richard who never in a million years did I think I'd fall in love with, but that's exactly what happened. Ever since that very first class, we started talking every day, and the sparks between us were undeniable. He always mentioned how he wished I could be in the Czech Republic with him, and I found myself daydreaming about our future wedding. Okay, so I was getting ahead of myself. 
but he was just so amazing. After a month of talking nonstop, I realized I was probably going to fail college if I didn't start setting my priorities straight. But all I could think about was him. And whenever we weren't chatting, I was stalking him on social media. And every time I saw him tagged with another girl, I got so jealous. This couldn't be healthy. I mean, I hadn't even met him in real life. But still, we continued to fall for each other. And he even introduced me to his two best friends, Anastasia and Pavel, via video chat. But not as blossoming as my love life, I was failing miserably at college. I'd always been the one who laughed at my lovesick friends, and now I was no better than them. This wasn't right. Something had to change. So even though it was killing me inside to do this, one night before sitting down on my desk to work on my assignment, I just picked up my phone and blocked his WhatsApp, deactivated my Facebook, and all without letting him know. Yep, I full-on ghosted him. It was such a hard decision. Because that night, instead of getting anything done for the assignment, I found myself lying in bed with a tear-soaked pillow. It hurt so much, but I had to think about my future. My parents would kill me if I didn't get a good job. I couldn't let them down. Anyway, Pavel messaged me a few days later saying Richard had gone totally crazy and he'd never seen him this upset before. He barely ate anything and would drink all day. He's not much different from a zombie now. But I stayed unfazed. Bet he'd be okay, though. He was young and handsome, and girls were always after him. He'd get over me soon. And I'd get over him, right? If only it were that easy. I missed him every single day. Even though we'd been thousands of miles apart, he somehow always made me feel so safe, like he was right there next to me. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. Ugh. Instead of wasting time overthinking, it'd be better to put all my energy into my studies for now. Right? And it worked. When graduation came around, I was the top student in my class and even got accepted on an exchange program in Australia. Without even thinking, I texted Richard to tell him the good news. I apologized for disappearing on him and said it had messed with my mind because I hadn't expected to fall for him so hard. I had just needed some time to finish my studies, but now I was ready to reconnect again. Well, he'd seen my messages, but there was no reply. It felt like someone had punched me in the heart. Hours later, he finally replied and said, Sorry, Jenny. I'll get in touch soon. Now isn't the best time. I couldn't believe the words I was reading. I could actually hear the sound of my heart shattering, but it served me right. I was the one who'd gotten rid of him. He deserved better. But still, I stalked him every day online, and then I realized the only way to solve this would be to fly to the Czech Republic and find him. First, though, I had my exchange program in Australia. I bought a new phone and got a new number for the trip to leave my old one in Korea for my uncle who was always complaining about his outdated phone. Those three months in Australia were awesome, and I got my mind off things for a little. I was ready to start fresh when I got back from the trip, until my uncle told me that someone had texted me on my old phone, but because he didn't know English, he didn't know if it was for me or not. I immediately checked it, and there was a message from Richard that said, Jenny, I'm so sorry for my last message. I miss you so much. Your smile, your eyes, your voice. I hope you can give me another chance. Love, Richard. OMG! Months had passed since he'd sent it, and the worst part of all is that my uncle had read the message, and so it said seen. This was a disaster. Okay, but I had to focus on the positive. He missed me. Maybe it wasn't too late. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer, so I texted him and explained what had happened. He finally replied and said he thought I'd given up on him. I'd never give up on him. We then had a proper phone call. I am still thinking about you all the time. Why didn't you send me a Facebook message? The words tumbled out of my mouth in a rush, as if I was afraid I would lose contact with him again in any sec. Suddenly, he went all quiet, and then he told me he'd recently met someone, and that he hoped I'd understand and still want to be friends. I felt devastated. Why was it so hard for us? But in the end, there was no other choice for me. I just wished him well and hung up. All I could do now was move on. It was time to find someone else to date. Clearly, Richard and I weren't meant to be. My heart hurt, but I found a job and threw myself into it, giving it all my attention. Eventually, I got promoted, and after five years, I was able to help my parents pay off their debt. I even moved up to a management position. Of course, during this time, I dated a bit, but I couldn't make any of the relationships last. I just missed Richard all the time. I kept dreaming of us spending Christmas together. It was so frustrating. I mean, it had been five years, and we hadn't spoken at all. Why couldn't I just get over him? I occasionally went on his Facebook page, but all I could see was his profile pic that remained the same for years. I'd unfriended Anastasia and Pavel, too, so I couldn't stalk them either. 
For all I knew, he could be someone's husband now, maybe even a dad. And yet still, I never gave up hope that maybe we'd meet in real life, our paths would cross, and we'd finally get to be together. I couldn't stop thinking about this. And then three weeks before Christmas, I got a new following request on Instagram. I couldn't believe it. It was Pavel. And he was now married to Anastasia. This made me so happy. And he told me they were going on their honeymoon to Korea and hoped to see me. OMG, this was so exciting. I desperately wanted to ask him about Richard, but I was terrified to hear that he had kids or something. Anastasia messaged me too and asked how I was doing. I told her I was still single because I worked all the time. Hey, there was no way I could tell her it was because I was still obsessed with Richard. Anyway, the week flew by and finally I was at the airport awaiting to meet Pavel and Anastasia in real life. They both looked so sweet and I gave them the biggest hugs. After hugging them, I noticed someone standing behind them. Oh, and gee, was that Richard? What was he doing there? I was so stunned I couldn't move. It, it was really him. Pavel broke the silence by saying, we brought Richard along for you, Jenny. Feel free to hit him, bite him, kick him, or whatever you want to do if, if you think he deserves it. Out of complete shock, I just burst into tears. It had been six long years of total silence, and now here he was, looking at me. I asked myself, could I hug him? But I didn't even get a chance to answer my thought because he ran towards me and picked me up in his arms, squeezing me tightly. Then he whispered in my ear, I'm so sorry, Jenny. Please don't cry. I'm here. I won't leave you. I promise. Could I trust him, though? I was still in shock as I drove them to their hotel, and then again later when I drove to take them out for some Korean food. I was nervous about hanging out with them all, but we seriously had the best night eating, drinking, and laughing. The next day, Pavel and Anastasia would start their honeymoon. So maybe then Richard and I would have some time alone together to talk about whatever was left between us. After dropping them back at their hotel, I was driving away when suddenly I saw Richard running back towards me. He said he wanted to tell me something, so I pulled over and we sat down on a bench to talk. I listened as he told me that over the past six years he tried to date other girls, but it never worked out because I was always in the back of his mind. He said he'd spend most of his time working so he could save up to visit me or buy me a ticket so I could come and visit him. It had taken him longer than he'd hoped because his parents had got divorced and he'd been looking after his mom who was super depressed. A few months later, she was diagnosed with cancer and so he'd had to work even harder to help her pay for treatment. After three long years of fighting, she sadly passed away. And ever since then, he'd been feeling so lonely and sad. One day he asked Pavel to contact me somehow and when he found out I was still single, he was over the moon and decided it was finally time to come to Korea and see me. He said seeing me in real life had made him fall even more in love with me, which he hadn't thought was even possible. Then he hugged me tight and I couldn't stop crying. We spent Christmas together, just like I always dreamt of. And well, the rest is history. Here I am now, packing my bags to fly to the Czech Republic to see Richard. I can't wait to meet his family. And you'll never believe it, but we're even planning our wedding. The big question is, where do we live? Should I go there, or should he move to Korea? To be honest, it doesn't matter. As long as we're together, it'll be perfect. So it's true what they say. If something is meant to be, it'll be. Even if it takes a year or six. All I know is that I'm glad I had the patience, because I've never been happier. So, the data needs to be collected by Friday so we can... I lowered my head and stuffed a pretzel into my mouth. Danny, are you eating? My boss glared back at me. I wiped my mouth onto the back of my hand and with cheeks full of food muffled out. No, no, of course not. It turns out my eagerness to eat a delicious, salty, crunchy pretzel during a work meeting, I'd forgotten to turn my microphone off. Oops. Hey, so I'm Danny and I'm in love with food. Why, you ask? Well, food's the one thing that's always been there for me. Through the good times and the bad, it's never let me down. All it takes is a hamburger with extra cheese and a salted caramel cheesecake, and I'm a happy girl. Gee, I'm salivating just thinking about it. But then my love of food almost cost me everything. Here's how. So after the pretzel incident, my boss fired me. Harsh. I know. This left me with no job, and as a result, no money to buy tasty snacks. What a bummer. 
One night, I was lounging on the couch, watching a movie and daydreaming about eating a triple chocolate sundae, when Jake, my boyfriend, sat down next to me with a huge bowl of candy and started telling me about his work colleague's birthday party. Ooh, candy. I grabbed a handful and started shoveling it into my mouth. Thanks, Jake. He knew the way to my heart. In between munching, I asked him, Can you bring a plus one? I want to go with you. Please? He shrugged and said, Sure. I clapped my sticky hands together. Ooh, a party! This was so exciting, as parties meant there'd be food and lots of it. As soon as we arrived there, I made a beeline for the buffet table. OMG! This was amazing. There were club sandwiches, mini pizzas, and potato salad bowls. I lifted the entire serving bowl up and started spooning the food into my mouth. Then some woman appeared next to me, frowning. She said, Um, excuse me, please, can you not eat out of the serving bowl? With my mouth full, I replied, Oh, sorry, it, it tastes so good. Then I placed the bowl back down and grabbed a handful of potato chips. As she walked away, I heard her mutter under her breath, What a greedy guts. Eventually, Jake grabbed my arm and led me out of there. He was sulking and could barely meet my eye, so I asked him what was up. What's up? He grunted. Do you even need to ask? You sit around all day eating everything out of the cupboards. Then when I bring you along to my colleague's party, you hog the buffet? It was so embarrassing. This bummed me out. Um, I guess maybe I could have a little more self-control around party food. And I guess I did need to find a job. Besides, having money meant I could buy better snacks. And I wouldn't have to keep on taking Jake's. So I got a part-time job at my local cinema on the popcorn counter. Mmm, that sweet, buttery popcorn smell. How I adored it. I couldn't help it. It was there staring at me in all of its warm, golden stickiness. So in between serving a customer, I sneakily stuffed some into my mouth. What are you doing? My heart stopped as I heard a familiar voice behind me. I turned around and came face to face with my manager. I denied immediately. I, I wasn't doing anything. As popcorn popping out of my mouth, they shouted at me and accused me of eating all the profits. So unfair. So you guessed it, I was fired. Again. I arrived home early with a tear-stained face and a bag full of my favorite chocolate treats to cheer me up. Jake looked over at me from the couch and asked me what was up. I slumped down next to him, pulled the wrapper off a chalk bar, and said, I got fired again. I couldn't help it. it. It's popcorn. It's too tasty. Does this world need to be so cruel? Then I took a bite out of the chocolate. Mmm, delicious. Jake shook his head, then sighing, said, Danny, admit it. It's your gluttony that gets you into trouble. So what? I enjoy eating, that's all. It doesn't hurt anyone. I finished the chalk bar and started unwrapping the next one. Jake shook his head, then walked off. Whatever. I didn't need his support, as I had delicious chocolate to comfort me. Yum. One day, like every other day, I searched the house for snacks, but nope, there weren't any anymore. I didn't have any money, so I couldn't go to the shop. So instead, I went on my phone and searched mukbang videos to kill some time. As I watched two girls stuff their mouths full of french fries dipped in a strawberry shake, I had an idea. Of course. Why hadn't I thought of this earlier? I should become a mukbanger. I'd get to earn money while doing what I love, eating food. It was a win-win. For my first video, I kept it simple. It was just me in a white t-shirt, my phone as a camera, and a huge bowl of spaghetti. Crazily, people watched it and began following me. After a couple of videos, my popularity increased and my viewers started donating food and money to me. It was totally nuts. But with these things came the video requests, such as eat three tubs of fried chicken and ten plates of fried rice covered in mayo. Eating all this food did get kind of challenging. Once I was halfway through a hamburger eating video when I got a stitch in my stomach and had to stop. I so shouldn't have eaten pancakes for breakfast earlier. My fans were bummed out that I stopped the challenge and I felt really bad. I figured that if I was going to make this my job, then I'd have to start fasting beforehand so I could be at my best for the videos. Gee, this was hard work. 
One time I was so hungry, I went into the fridge and sniffed the cheese. But then when I finished a challenge, I felt so full and bloated that I resembled a puffer fish. Then there was the tiredness. I was so exhausted. I fell asleep on the bus to the supermarket and ended up in some weird town miles away. I had to ring Jacob to come and pick me up and he grumbled about it for the whole way back. Regardless of this, I carried on with the videos. But then one day a fan challenged me to the biggie, the fire noodle challenge. If you don't know what this is, then basically it involves a massive bowl full of the spiciest noodles ever. I took a mouthful of the noodles and OMG, I couldn't feel my tongue or face. My nose was running and I had to stick my tongue out to check if it was still there. This was just too much. There's no way I could endure any more of this. So I switched the bowl for non-spicy noodles and pretended I was eating the hot ones. Afterward, I edited the video, and hey, I think I did a great job of faking it. Even though I'd only had one mouthful of the spicy stuff, it was repeating on me. My stomach gurgled, and my tongue still felt numb. I lay on the couch with a hot water bottle pressed to my stomach, and feeling sorry for myself, Jake sat down next to me and gave me a concerned look. Danny, you gotta stop this video thing and get a real job. With my swollen tongue, I managed to sputter out, Eating on videos is a real job. Jake shook his head. Gluttony is not a hobby. Everyone's just laughing at you. Um, hello. I was being paid for eating. And these videos help many lonely people out there to have company during a meal. They were laughing with me, not at me. Jeez, Jake was so boring at times. Between the spicy noodle challenge and some weird bug eating challenge in which I used jelly worms covered in chocolate instead of the real deal, faking became the norm for me. Soon the articles started circulating saying I was a fake eater. Posts such as, she's faking all the time? And no wonder she's still in shape popped up everywhere. After that I had no choice but to live stream eat. Lots of my fans encouraged this, but it was hard work. It didn't take long for the weight to pile on, and within a month, I was up two dress sizes, and I felt super sluggish. One morning when Jake saw me searching my wardrobe for something, anything to wear that would fit me, he suggested we go jogging. I stared down at my favorite jeans that I now couldn't get past my thighs, and agreed to go. I had made it to the end of the block, and whoa, it was hot, and ugh, I couldn't breathe. I was crouched over, clutching a fence for support when a pregnant woman walked by. You're such an inspiration. Running at your age and after giving birth, even without this one, she clutched her bump. I wouldn't be able to manage it. What? Did she think I'd just had a baby and I was old? Oh, great. And now Jake burst out laughing too. I felt terrible. Did I really look that bad? This lingered in my mind, so I ended up going online and ordering some weight loss pills. I started taking them, and within a week, I had breakouts, stinky breath, awful wind, and I felt like a slug. Then one time I was in the kitchen taking the pills when Jake walked in, saw what I was doing, snatched them out of my hand, and said, Danny, look at you. You're a mess. You have to stop the pills and stop the videos. I was angrier than a nest of disturbed wasps, so I snatched the pills off him and kicked him out of the room. Then I yelled, You don't get it! Just leave me alone! Jake didn't say much to me after that, and I carried on with my mukbang bubble. Soon I hit 100,000 subscribers, and to celebrate, I went live with the table packed full of my favorite foods, fried chicken, pizza, donuts, and so on. I was stuffing my face when I felt so hot and sticky the room began to spin. I slurred out, I, I don't feel so good. Then I fainted in the middle of a live stream. I woke up a few hours later in the hospital with a drip in my arm and a serious face doctor glaring down at me. They told me that I had high cholesterol and if I carried on like this, I'd end up with diabetes and stomach bleeding. Well, that was it. I burst into tears and vowed that I would make some big changes. I love eating. That will never change. But I just can't do the mukbang videos anymore. Now, I still enjoy food, but I don't overindulge anymore. 
Oh, I also have a new job working in a restaurant, and amazingly, I've managed to resist eating all of the tasty-looking food. I'm on the way to becoming the cute, confident version of myself again. And from now on, if I'm happy, sad, or whatever, well, I talk to Jake about it instead of turning to food. I will always love food, but I guess I eventually figured out that I love my health and Jake even more. Shh, don't tell him that. It'll give him a big head. I've never liked hospitals. Yeah, I get it. No one really does. Yet here I was sitting in the hospital waiting area, silently praying that she would be all right. Jeez, I was shaking like an old dog left out in the cold. I just couldn't think straight. Why was no one telling me if she would be okay? Suddenly, a stern-faced doctor appeared and told me, Sir, the operation was a success. Your sister will be just fine. You can go through and see her now. I didn't know whether to burst into tears because of relief or to run away because of fear. Finally, I still went to see her. She blinked open her eyes, then fixed them on me, and in a groggy voice said, Who are you? I get it. My appearance unnerves people. I've never been a looker, and this scar sure doesn't help. But people will always judge. Maybe if they stop to talk to me, then I can tell them that I'm a military veteran who got it due to an accident during training. Training I was doing so I could fight to save their butts. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Now, talking about the girl in the hospital, let me continue my story. Well, it began with my evening shift as a delivery driver. I was humming along to the radio when this girl came out of nowhere and ran straight into the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late. I heard a thud. She was lying there all limp. It was horrible. For a moment, I thought she was dead, and I was too scared to check on her. Suddenly, a thought of abandoning her popped up in my mind. But no, I couldn't be that heartless, so I ran to check her pulse. Phew, she was still alive. I called for an ambulance and told her help was on the way. In the hospital, the doctor said she needed emergency surgery, but they had to have a relative's consent first. The girl had no ID on her or anything. What was I meant to do? I couldn't just sit there and let her die. So I blurted out, I give my permission. I'm her brother. When the girl asked me who I was, well, I had no idea how to reply. The doctor concluded that she must have memory loss. So, who are you? The girl asked me again. I couldn't go changing my story now, so I replied, I'm Chelvin, your brother. Oh, hi, Chelvin. I'm sorry. I don't remember you. This girl seemed so sweet. I instantly warmed to her. It's been just me and my dog Buster for I don't know how many years. Girls usually take one look at me and run away as fast as their heeled shoes can take them. But this girl wasn't looking at me like they did. The doctors asked me what her name was, so I said Alice. That was my mother's name. Before I even knew what I was doing, I'd use my savings to pay for her hospital fees. Then I visited her every day. I thought she'd ask me about her family, friends, I don't know, everything. But nope. She just liked listening to me ramble on, mainly about Buster. When she was ready to leave the hospital, I took her back to my house. I made up the spare room and bought some new bed covers, laid some clothes out on the bed, and put some flowers in there to make it look nice. Alice seemed to like it. She smiled, told me I was sweet, then hugged me. I bet I was blushing like a beetroot. I left her there to get ready. Then I made a start on dinner. She came downstairs in this dress I'd bought at the mall for her, and oh my days, she looked like a picture. I made an excuse to go and get her a drink, so she wouldn't see how flustered I was. I thought she'd ask me stuff about her life, but she didn't. Not one question. So I decided to tell her anyway. I mean, I'd spent days making the backstory up, so I may as well share it with her. It's just you and me now, and it has been that way for a long time. Our parents passed away some years ago now. Our mom, she was called Alice too. Oh, it's a nice name, she muttered back. Do I look like her? Um, yes, you have her hair. I told her a few other things, such as how she'd just broken up with her boyfriend 
I was in between homes at the moment. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like she was soaking my words in and taking some comfort from them. The next day, things changed, and Alice started doing erratic things. I went downstairs bright and early to find that she'd emptied all of my kitchen cupboards and was scrubbing them clean. When I asked her what she was doing, she ignored me and carried on. It's like she was in her own bubble and couldn't hear me at all. I told myself this was probably just her way of adjusting to everything. But then her odd behavior continued. When a delivery guy knocked on the door, she leaped behind the couch. Afterward, I asked her what was up. But she said she was just looking for her lost earring. Another time, I was waiting for my favorite TV show to start, and we were both chatting on the couch. But she suddenly grabbed the TV remote, turned it off, then walked out of the room with the remote. This was normal, right? She'd been through a lot. Maybe this was a stage of her recovery? Most of the time, she was such a sweet and lovely girl. She always packed food and snacks for me to take to work, and she made such a fuss of Buster. Okay, so she still did her cupboard cleaning ritual every single morning, but hey, we all have our quirks. Having another mouth to feed meant I had to work more hours, but I didn't mind it. For once, I felt like a purpose. She helped me find the reason to live again, instead of just existing. I often took her treats home, such as cookies or Hawaiian pizza, her favorites. If I was working night shifts, she always waited up for me. It made me feel so warm inside when I arrived home and saw her sitting there with Buster. I had no money left at the end of each month, but I had something more. I had happiness. I liked this girl. I more than liked her, but I couldn't tell her this, as she thought I was her brother. I knew I needed to tell her the truth but I just didn't know how to go about doing so. One morning, after she'd finished her cupboard cleaning and we were enjoying breakfast, I told her about the job I had on, delivering a parcel to Sherry Hill Street. Her eyes widened. Then she told me she wanted to come too. This was surprising, as she'd shown no interest in leaving the house before. I mean, she refused to even take Buster for a walk, but I agreed without questioning her. I told her to wait in the lorry while I delivered the parcel. Only when I got back, she wasn't there. I ran around the block searching for her. But then I saw a crowd and it seemed like there's a car accident. My face paled. I ran as fast as I could to see who the victim was and luckily it wasn't her. Phew. I kept looking around and finally I found her. She was sitting on the curb with her head in her hands. She was crying. I sat down next to her and hugged her. She might be too scared witnessing the terrible accident. Then, when she was ready, I took her home. The next morning, I went downstairs expecting to see her cleaning the cupboards, but she wasn't there. I made her some toast and a coffee and took them up to her room. She opened the door, glared at me, then said, I remember everything. I know you're not my brother. Alice, I'm so sorry. I just, I just wanted to help you. She shouted at me. My name's not even Alice. Then she stormed past me. I rushed after her and heard the door bang shut. She'd gone. So that's it. I was back to my lonely, sad life. Each day after work, I came home to see no one waiting for me. No hot meals, no laugh, nothing but a boring, empty house. Three months went by, and one day I was delivering some boxes to this rich shop owner guy. The boxes were very heavy, and one of them fell out of my arms and hit the floor. The shop guy started yelling at me. You idiot, I'm not paying you to be neglectful. But then what do I expect? You can't even look after your own face. I didn't say anything. Instead, I peered down at my feet. Then I heard footsteps. So I looked up and there she was. It was Alice. Oh no, I didn't want her to see me being scorned at like this. Suddenly she shouted at the man. Hey, just because you have money doesn't mean you can say anything to others. Apologize to him or I will not let up on you. The man sneered and told her to go away. I couldn't deal with this, so I walked away. But Alice rushed after me and called out to me. Please, Chelvin, let me tell you the truth. I stopped walking, and that's when she told me everything. It turns out she'd never lost her memory. She faked it because she wanted to escape her miserable life. Her husband was a cruel man who cheated on her, beat her, and controlled her. He was a famous TV presenter, which is why she turned off the TV that time as she'd seen him on there. 
She hid when the doorbell rang as she was terrified it'd be him. And she tidied the cupboard every morning out of habit as if she didn't do it back home, he would beat her. What? This was crazy. I needed answers. So I asked her, so you faked regaining your memories? And that outburst, it was all a lie? Chelvin, I'm so sorry. I knew I couldn't drag you into my personal life anymore. I used to live in Sherry Hill Street. That's why I came with you. I found out my husband thought I was dead, so he married another woman. I made him sign the divorce papers and set me free. I also made him give me a payout, else I'd ruin his precious career. Then she handed me some money and told me it was to cover the expenses for when she was living with me, and that she'd also send me some money to cover her hospital fees. We hugged, and I cried like a baby. Gee, this was all too much for me. But then, to my surprise, she grinned, went to shake my hand, then said, Hey, I'm Julia. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, after that, thanks to her ex, Julia was able to buy a nice little house. Actually, I'm helping her renovate it. We've become pretty great friends. To be honest, just looking at her makes my stomach flip. I love her so much. I know I need to tell her. Life's far too short not to. If she says no, well, then at least I'll still have her friendship, right? I might not have model looks, but I'm a good person. Julia's taught me to realize that. I hope she says yes, but what will be, will be. Wish me luck. I've always been an overly possessive kind of girl, and I can't stand it if people touch stuff that belongs to me, especially if they do it without asking my permission first. And my boyfriend is no exception to that rule. Honestly, I was so worried that he'd cheat on me that I literally couldn't sleep at night. And then I did something that I'll regret for the rest of my life. I met Otis in the guitar club at school. He was tall, handsome, and smart, which made him very popular. But he's not a playboy. He'd only ever dated one girl called Sam before, who he broke up with last year. I often wondered if he still loved her, but I'd started to notice him always sitting next to me in the guitar club, and soon we were talking a lot. One day, he confessed that he had a major crush on me and asked me to be his girlfriend. I couldn't believe it! I was on cloud nine! But very quickly, I started to panic. I didn't want any other girl stealing him from me. I made our relationship very public and shared our photos on every social media platform. We were inseparable, and I always kept my eyes on him. Otis seemed fine with this. In fact, he thought it was kind of cute how much I doted on him. But none of that eased my obsession with the fact that he might cheat on me. It was all I thought about. So there was only one thing for it. I had to test him. I had to make sure he really loved me. I created a few fake social media accounts and used images of really hot girls to see if Otis would flirt with them. Then I tried to add him as a friend from these accounts and send him flirty messages. One time, I even sent super sexy photos to him from one of these fake accounts. Believe it or not though, he ignored them. I felt so relieved. So he did love me. I could relax. Well, for the moment, anyway. But it didn't take long for the worry to set in again. I'm not proud to admit this, but I even hired a boyfriend test service. I chose the most beautiful girl, even though the service was crazy expensive. I had it all planned out. It was just Otis and I at my house one night. We ordered dinner, and then I told him I needed to go buy some soda at the store. After I left, the girl arrived disguised as the delivery guy. She brought the food into Otis, and I sat in the car outside watching them on my phone. The girl had attached a mini camera onto the box of food, and she placed it on the table so I could clearly see everything happening between them. She was so seductive in her tight, mini dress and kept flirting with Otis, but he just wasn't interested. I sat in the car amazed. I was so proud of him. I had been sure he'd not be able to resist her. After that, I decided that I'd played enough games, and now I could really trust him. But then, one day at school, Sam and her new boyfriend, Louis, walked past our table. She looked at Otis and said, You two look happy, don't you? I'm glad you finally found someone to replace me. Then she just walked away, without so much as even glancing in my direction. 
It was like I was invisible to her. So, she thought I was just some replacement, huh? That was it. I had to prove to her that Otis loved me now and that she meant nothing to him. Later that night, I texted her on social media, annoyed that she thought I was scared and jealous of her and that Otis only loved her? I couldn't believe it. I didn't know why Otis had dated someone like her before. I got annoyed and gave her a challenge that we would flirt with each other's boyfriends for a week and see whose boyfriend was a faithful person. She said it sounded fun and that she'd love a challenge like this. But really, I was only doing this to make sure Otis really loved me and had no more feelings for Sam. So the plan was set. That weekend, both Sam and I asked our boyfriends to go to the cinema. But then at the last minute, we both made up excuses about why we couldn't go even though our boyfriends had already bought the tickets. I went to the cinema where Sam's boyfriend, Louis, was, and acted as if it was just by chance that I was there too. I asked why he was alone, and he said, Oh, Sam had a family thing, so I've been stood up. I told him I was on my way to buy a ticket, and he said I could just use Sam's. Yes, the plan was working. We watched the movie together and even hung out afterwards to chat. After that night, Louis messaged me a few times. And one day, I even walked home from school with him. By the end of that week, it became clear to me that Lewis was actually interested in me, and he even invited me out for dinner. But Otis was also still giving me lots of attention. He even told me about what Sam had been doing and was very apologetic. He kept saying it was really annoying, and why couldn't she just leave him alone? I was so happy to hear this. It felt like I'd won. Both guys liked me and no one liked Sam. I decided to meet Louis for dinner and wait for him to tell me how he felt about me. Then I could tell Sam and she'd be so upset. Served her right though, for assuming Otis was still in love with her. But that night, things didn't go exactly as planned. We were sitting having dinner when all of a sudden, Louis leaned into me and kissed me passionately. I closed my eyes and all I could think about was how I'd won and Sam had lost. But then I heard a click-click sound, and I froze. I opened my eyes, turned around, and there was Sam, standing there taking photos of us. She started laughing like a crazy person, and Lewis walked over to her and joined her. I had no idea what was going on, but then they told me. They'd deliberately done this. Sam had told Lewis to pretend to fall for me just so she could catch me out. I couldn't believe it. How could she be so evil? She sent all the photos to Otis, and now I feel so ashamed. Otis was so angry, and no matter how much I tried to explain, he wouldn't believe me. And it's all my fault, all because of my possessiveness. What can I do to get Otis to understand I didn't mean it and that I really love him? Hi, my name's Baron, and I'm 17. I guess that every student has at least one teacher that they hate, right? In my case, it's my PE teacher, Mr. Green. You're probably wondering why, so here we go. I'm an academic kid, and the sporty way of life just isn't for me. I actually enjoy studying, especially anything math and science related. I just don't understand why the school forces me to do P.E. Spending hours jumping about in a sweaty mess just seems pointless to me. I could be using this time to read a coding book or something. I wasn't built for sports. I was the skinny kid who turned bright red just thinking about running. Then during one torturous P.E. lesson, I couldn't jump over the horizontal bar at the boy's height. So the teacher lowered it to the girl's height for me, and worse still, I still couldn't jump over it. Humiliating! And after that, some small-brained boys nicknamed me Miss High Jump. Ugh, how annoying. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, in steps a new P.E. teacher, Mr. Green. Honestly, he was quite popular at school, as he was good-looking, muscular, and was a national medalist in the pole jump. Whenever he appeared, girls' squeals would be heard across the hall, and boys kept following him to ask about his diet and workout plan to get six-pack abs. Meanwhile, I couldn't stand him a bit. What's so good about that Hulk guy? Once I even spotted him checking out his reflection in his stopwatch. Pathetic. Mr. Green made the P.E. class hell. He always made us do these stupid exercise routines. Then when I messed up, he corrected me in front of everyone. 
It was so humiliating. Then he said, Baron, I get that sport is your weakness, so let's practice more and then you'll get bigger. Firstly, I didn't want to bulk up. And secondly, his actions made me a complete joke to my classmates. Why was he so strict with me? Was it because I was the only one not staring at him with gooey eyes? Great, as if it wasn't bad enough being called Miss High Jump, now I had Mr. Green to deal with. So, game on. It's time I hit him where it hurts, his appearance. I snuck into my mom's room and took one of her red lipsticks. Then I smeared it on his red whistle. And as expected, after blowing it, his lips were fully covered with red lipstick. It was so funny. Not so much Mr. Green anymore, more like Mr. Red. <laughs> Everyone was laughing, but no one told him why. Seeing his confused face was so hilarious. But then he went to the bathroom and seconds later he shouted. I rushed to see his reaction and OMG, it was priceless. However, catching me grinning at the bathroom door, he seemed to know who's to blame. Oops. After that, he was stricter with me. He always made me lug the training equipment for the whole class. Yes, only me. So I decided to get my own back. I poked some small holes in one of the tennis balls, then filled it with black ink. As expected when he hit it, all the ink inside went on his face and clothes. Ha! He looked like an octopus. Of course, he knew it was me, so I ended up with a week's detention, but it was so worth it. That's when Mr. Green got determined to make my life a misery. He forced me to run extra laps on the field and made me attempt hurdles that I was never going to clear. And then he just smirked at me and said something like, Well, young Baron, practice makes perfect. The feud between us was endless. However, I soon had something much more important to care about. There was a new girl in my class called Susie, and oh boy, was she pretty. It was love at first sight, but unfortunately, I wasn't alone in liking her. Whatever, the other boys might have the brawn, but I had the brains. So I spent hours thinking up ways to impress her and to make her mine. I don't have a lot of experience in this sort of thing, so I turned to romantic films for help. And I quickly learned that girls loved soppy gestures, so I put a love letter in her locker. I even sprayed some of my mom's perfume on it. Girls like fragrant things, right? But when she opened the locker door, dozens of letters like mine fell out. Another time, I brought her some cupcakes. I planned to get to class early and leave them on her desk. Only when I stepped in the classroom, her desk was already covered in cakes, chocolate, and drinks. It was like stepping into a candy store. I needed to change the plan. I'd have to think big if I was going to impress Susie. So one day I asked some friends to go up to Susie and annoy her. And then when she freaked out, I would swoop in to protect her. You know, like a hero. Everything was going according to plan. And I was about to run over and save the day. But then Mr. Green suddenly appeared. He scolded them and even threatened to report them to the principal. They were scared to death and immediately ran away. Mission failed. I was about to leave when suddenly I saw Mr. Green grab Susie's arm and whispered something to her. Whoa, what a slime ball! Susie looked really annoyed, but he didn't give up. I was so mad I ran over there and yelled at him. Let her go, or else I'll report this to the principal. Then, to his surprise, I grabbed her hand and led her away. After a while, I turned to Susie and asked, Are you okay? She smiled and said, Yeah, thanks for helping me. Her bright smile drove me crazy. I stammered. You're welcome. Uh, if he pesters you again, just tell me. And could you believe it? After that day, Susie and I became closer. She even texted me whenever she had problems with math, physics, or other subjects. See? Brain always wins. Then the following week, during another torturous P.E. class, I noticed Mr. Green trying to hand Susie a bottle of water. She wouldn't take it from him, but he kept on trying to pass it to her. What a weirdo. Fueled by love, I ran over to them, grabbed the water bottle, then said, She doesn't want it, so leave her alone. I led her over to the fountain to calm down. Then seeing how sad she looked, I said, Don't worry, I won't let him harm you. She turned to me and replied, It's okay, I don't think he means anything by it. Maybe he just cares about me. I interrupted her. No, he isn't a good guy. He wants you. She laughed and said that I got it all wrong, but I still felt worried, so I said, Today after class, let me walk you home. At first she refused, but I was insistent, so in the end she agreed. After that, I walked her home every day after school, and guess what? It turns out we got on so well. Time zooms by when I'm with her. I guess I should be thanking Mr. Green. It's because of him Susie knows who I am. But nah, he's a jerk. How dare he bug Susie? He was way out of line. He needed to be stopped. So one day I went to the sports hall where Mr. Green was arranging equipment, approached him and said, 
I know you like Susie, but she doesn't like you, so please stop disturbing her. If I report this to the principal, you'll lose your job. He continued to sort out the equipment, then smirking, he replied, It's not any of your business. This made me so mad, so I yelled at him. It is my business, as I love Susie, and I'll protect her at all costs. He laughed. You're not in a position to talk to me about this. Come back when you're Susie's official boyfriend. What? How dare he say that? His words played on my mind. So that evening, I decided to go to Susie's house to confess my feelings towards her. However, as soon as I arrived, I saw Mr. Green standing in front of her house. He grabbed her hand and hugged her. How dare he? Anger took over me as I quickly ran over, pulled Susie away. And then to my surprise, I punched him in the face. I don't know who was more shocked, him or me. Ouch, my hand hurt. Before I could say anything, Susie shouted, Dad, are you okay? Dad, what was going on here? I froze and stared at them. Baron, what are you doing? You've got it all wrong, he's my dad. What? Mr. Green was Susie's dad? Well, she could have told me that earlier. We went inside and Susie got the first aid kit and patched up Mr. Green's nose and my hand. Then she told me the truth. Turns out her mom and Mr. Green used to date back in high school. But then her mom fell pregnant with Susie. He freaked out and refused to be part of their lives. So her mom moved away with her. But now they were back in town and Mr. Green was apologetic for how he behaved and wanted to be a father to her. But she was struggling to move on from the past and forgive him. Whoa. I couldn't believe I punched my crush's dad in the face. Talk about embarrassing. Although he looked more humiliated at the fact than me. A skinny boy with no athletic ability had actually made his nose bleed. That night I couldn't get a wink of sleep. Now Susie would never want to see me again and Mr. Green would hate me even more. Ugh, it was a huge mess. After that I tried to avoid Susie at school. As for Mr. Green, he stopped being so strict on me. Was he scared of Miss High Jump's punch now? Ha. <laughs> okay, I know, I shouldn't joke about this. But let me have a laugh. This man has just ruined his chance with the love of his life here. Then one day when I was tiredly walking back home, someone patted my shoulder. I turned back and saw Susie. To my surprise, she said, Hey, you promised to walk me home. Are you breaking your word or something? I stammered. I, I thought you hated me, so... She smiled and said that her dad didn't blame me either. In fact, thanks to my punch, they talked properly and now understood each other more. She leaned her head on my shoulder and said, Baron, thanks for always protecting me. Whoa, this day couldn't be better. The girl of my dreams didn't hate me, result. But I'm still scared to death of her dad. So basically, there are two missions that I need to complete. Firstly, I need to apologize to Mr. Green. And secondly, I need to improve my grade in PE class to impress him. The second mission sounds <laughs> near on impossible. So wish me luck, as I'm going to need it. I was out for my afternoon jog and decided to take a new route. Suddenly, I saw a huge European-style mansion and had to stop to gaze at it. The walls were covered in moss, and honestly, it looked pretty eerie. I looked up, and a flock of crows were standing on the roof cawing. It sent shivers up my spine and immediately made me think of movies like The Conjuring or something. Wouldn't be surprised if that house was haunted. Suddenly, I got startled by the voice of an old lady. The mansion looks magnificent, doesn't it? I turned to look at her, and she continued, But you'd better stay away from it. Why? I asked her. Then she looked at me more closely and said, Oh, you aren't a local here, are you? I told her I was from Minnesota but that my parents had said I could spend the summer here with my aunt. Well, dear, let me tell you. The owner of this mansion was a young girl, super rich, but kept herself to herself. Rumor has it, she worshipped Satan. Can you believe it? I asked her, so where is she now? Oh, she mysteriously disappeared years ago, and the house has been abandoned ever since, the lady replied. Okay, this was seriously freaky. My hair was literally standing on end. But for some reason, I was more intrigued than ever. Oh, sorry, 
I should have introduced myself. I'm Ellie, a typical high school student, but also an avid detective story blogger. I spend a lot of my time on detective story forums and have always been attracted to weird and mysterious things ever since I was a little kid. Anyway, back to my story. So, one night, my aunt asked me to pop over to the grocery store to get some milk. On my way back, I passed the mansion and instantly got shivers. I looked up and saw a light flickering in a window on the second floor, like a candle or something. But no way. The old lady said the place was abandoned, right? The light kept flickering, and I couldn't stop watching. Suddenly, a shadow of a girl appeared. She was playing the violin, and the gloomy music was wafting through the cracks in the walls. Then, out of nowhere, a crow flew by screaming, Gah! I almost leapt out of my skin and ran straight home. How could anyone live in that freaky mansion? Wait a minute, what if I'd just seen the ghost of the owner who disappeared? Oh man, I had to figure this mystery out. I could even turn it into a detective story with a bit of horror thrown in for fun. As I lay there, I came up with the title, Real Life Death Mansion. And then I realized I could even make a YouTube video about it with real photos of the house and maybe even some footage taken inside as I uncover the mystery. Oh, this would be so good! I could barely sleep from excitement, and the next day, I asked my cousin Susan to come along and explore the mansion with me. Hey Susan, want to come check out that creepy mansion with me? OMG, Ellie, are you crazy? You know that place is haunted, right? Like, full of ghosts and everything. Yeah, that's why I asked you to go with me. I shrugged. I would rather make a detour than walk past that house to get home. So what makes you think I would dare to go inside? I tried to convince her it would be fun, but she kept refusing. Oh well, if no one dared to go into that mansion, then I shall be the first. Gathering up my courage, I went there alone. I managed to climb over the rusty iron fence that had almost fallen to pieces in the backyard. Then I noticed a door that was slightly ajar. As I got closer, I realized a satanic symbol was engraved on the door. Creepy! I closed my eyes, held my breath, and gently pushed the door open. The smell that hit me made me feel dizzy. A musty, abandoned kind of smell. I walked into the lounge, and it felt like I just walked into some old castle in France or something. There were cobwebs everywhere, and some massive ones hanging from the chandeliers. I looked around and noticed a portrait of a girl on the wall. She was beautiful, but her eyes looked so sad. Oh my, was this the owner? The one I'd seen playing the violin? I couldn't bear to look at the portrait any longer. It felt like her eyes were piercing my soul. I headed for the stairs and crept up as quietly as possible. I won't lie, I was terrified. It was so dark up there, and with every step I took, the floorboards creaked. I kept looking behind me, as it sounded like someone was following me. By this point, I'd broken out into a cold sweat. When I made it to the second floor, there was a long corridor ahead, but it was really weird. There was only one door. I walked towards it and pushed it open. It was a luxury room, definitely fit for a princess. And yep, there was the violin. Everything was coated in a thick layer of dust, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a picture. It was the same girl, but this time, her eyes were glowing red like fire, just like Sauron, the villain in The Lord of the Rings. I was so scared that I quickly turned the photo face down. This was when I heard the violin sound from somewhere. Okay, what was going on? The violin was right before my eyes, and I was supposed to be the only one in the house? I tried to calm down, took a deep breath, and walked in the direction of the sound next door. It was so weird, because the next door was an exact replica of the first room. Had I actually changed rooms? I walked towards the dressing table and noticed the photo in here was also turned face down. I picked it up, and it was the exact same photo, but this time, the face of the girl was bleached white. 
I dropped the photo in horror and ran off without looking back. I ran down the stairs three at a time, but when I reached the door, it was locked. I started banging on it, and by then I was hysterically crying. Help! Help me! I screamed. Suddenly, someone's hand touched my shoulder. My heart had definitely jumped out of my chest. Uh, ah! I yelled at the top of my lungs, but when I turned around, there was this young guy standing there. A pretty cute one. Who, who are you? I stuttered. He frowned at me and said, Who are you? And why are you here? I, I... I could barely speak as I was shaking so much. Then the guy said, Come on, let's get out of here. You look horrified. Then he took out a key and opened the door. Are... are you a ghost or something? I stuttered. He started laughing and said, Pretty creepy place, right? I asked him if he saw the photos too, and he said, Yes, terrifying. Like something out of a horror movie, I added. Exactly. Perfect setting for a horror movie. I stared in confusion, and he laughed and said, Yup, we're making a movie. I mean, I'm gonna rent this place to make a horror movie. Then he introduced himself as Jack, a young director who was interested in detective and horror movies. He was just checking the place out to see if it was suitable. I couldn't believe it. Wow, this is literally a dream come true. I've been writing detective stories since I could hold a pen, and I've always hoped I'd become a screenwriter on horror and detective movies one day. I'm so honored to meet you. I'm Ellie, by the way. Then Jack replied, The pleasure's all mine. It's a pretty exciting industry to be in. I'd love to read some of your stuff sometime. I couldn't stop grinning. Then suddenly, another person showed up. Jack introduced him as Michael, a member of his film crew. But compared to how friendly Jack was, Mike was serious and intimidating. Jack could tell that I was nervous, so he laughed and said, Michael's been under a lot of stress, so he looks a bit grumpy, right? I just smiled shyly and asked Jack if I could have his number. As I walked home, I couldn't believe how happy I felt. Who knew such a scary adventure would turn into an epic opportunity? I texted Jack right away, saying I would love to learn more about his film, and I had to admit, I might have had a slight crush on him. He was so cute. I kept checking my phone, but he hadn't replied. That was so disappointing. But then, a few days later, he asked me out for coffee. I was so excited. And seriously, we had the best time. He even offered to drive me home. When I got into the car, he told me to close my eyes. Eek! Maybe he was going to kiss me. I was so nervous, but suddenly, something hit my face, and I didn't know anything else. When I woke up, I found myself in some kind of warehouse, with my hands and feet tied, and my mouth taped shut. Oh my god. Had I been kidnapped? Where was Jack? Suddenly, I heard a noise outside. I looked through the window and saw Jack and Michael talking to each other. What? Did the two of them plan this? But why? A moment later, Michael left, and Jack came towards me and removed the tape from my mouth. I started screaming. Why are you doing this to me? Then Jack said, Listen. I'm not going to hurt you, I swear, but there's something I need to tell you. Then he confessed that he was a member of a criminal organization named Iron Gloves. His gang were operating from the mansion, and so everything from the story of the mysterious missing girl, the ghost playing the violin, the eerie photos, were all made up by them. They did it so that no one would dare approach their headquarters. According to the gang's rules, any outsider that entered the mansion would be killed, to protect the secrecy of the group. Michael had seen me enter, and reported it to the boss. So Jack had been forced to carry out the mission, but he didn't want to do it, so that's why he pretended to kidnap me. Dear good God, this was too much! He asked me to leave right away, but I was worried about him. He said, don't worry. I've been wanting to leave for a long time, and so I have a plan. 
Fast forward two years, and now I'm a freshman majoring in screenwriting. It's so exciting chasing my passion, but I still think that summer at my aunt's was one of my best yet. Terrifying, but thrilling. Oh, and as for Jack, after we chatted in the warehouse, he let me go, and I quickly packed up all my stuff at my aunt's and flew home. A few weeks later, I saw an article that said he'd turned himself in and that the police had caught the Iron Gloves gang. Now, Jack's in prison, but will soon be free. I have a feeling that deep down, he's a good guy, and I hope that I'll have the chance to meet him again and get to know the real him better. Who knows? His real-life experience might help me write one hell of an awesome story, too. Hi, my name is Happiness. You're impressed with my name, right? My dad gave me that name. And yeah, as you can guess, he put a lot of hopes and dreams in me. I'm now 18 years old, and tomorrow I will fly to Massachusetts to start my college. My parents are preparing a farewell party for me downstairs. I have never left my hometown and been away from my family, so this is such an occasion. As I'm packing my belongings for college, a flood of memories come to mind. You see, when I was a kid, my family was dirt poor. We lived in an old, dilapidated house on the outskirts of Selma in Alabama. I remember we would buy a chicken at the beginning of the month, and my parents would make it last the whole month. I didn't realize we were poor, though. In fact, at that point, I was just a happy, carefree little girl, but that wouldn't last. My mom worked as a cleaner for a rich family, but they treated her terribly, and she barely earned enough money to even take the bus there. My dad was a lorry driver, and so he was away a lot, delivering goods to other states. Every weekend when he came home, I'd stand out on the porch as soon as I saw his big truck driving up the dusty road. I'd run out there and jump up and down. The best part was that he always brought me a little present, like a piece of candy that he'd save for me, or a small toy. They weren't valuable gifts, but they meant the world to me. One time he came home, and I ran up to him and said, Daddy, yesterday Jeannie's dad brought her a chocolate egg back from his trip. It even had a toy inside. I want one too. My dad looked confused. Then he said he'd heard of them, and they were called Kinder Eggs. And then, with loving eyes and a smile, he promised he'd find me one, no matter how hard it would be, even if it was the last thing he did. The next weekend, I raced out to the street and could barely contain my excitement as I waited for him to come home. I waited and waited but still he didn't arrive. I started to get worried, so I asked my mom where he was. She said, oh, sweetie, he's on his way. Why don't you go to sleep, and as soon as you wake up, he'll be here. There was no way I could sleep. All I could think about was getting a chocolate egg with a toy inside. I'd almost dozed off when I heard his voice. I ran downstairs and jumped into his arms, hugging him. I missed you, Daddy, I told him, and he laughed and said, I missed you too, sweetie pie. Then I said, um, where is it? Did you get me a chocolate egg? I eagerly asked. Then his face dropped. He said, Sorry, baby. I was working late, so I didn't have time to buy one. But I promise I'll bring you two next time to make up for it. Okay? But this wasn't okay. I was so disappointed. I pushed him away from me and burst into tears, saying, You promised! You promised me! I had never cried like that before over something so small. But at the time, it felt like such a big deal, and my dad looked confused to see me so upset. At that moment, my mom came through and saw me. She immediately understood everything, then started to comfort my dad. Come on, honey, take a rest. You've worked yourself too hard recently. Come eat. You're so skinny these days. This just made me more annoyed. I was the one who needed comforting, not my dad. So I shouted at my mom, Mommy, Daddy didn't keep his promise. But my mom just ignored me, and so I stormed back up the stairs, crying all the way. After I'd calmed down, my mom came to my room and said, Happiness, your dad works so hard, and you should just be happy that he's home safely. I know he didn't bring you what you wanted, but he will next time, okay? In the meantime, I'll make your favorite cupcakes every day. Every day? Wow, okay, I said to her. And she really did. She made me cupcakes every day, and I was so happy. 
After a few days, I said to her, Mommy, I like you more than Daddy. I don't even love him anymore because he broke his promise. My mom just looked at me and said, Oh, happiness, you don't know what you're saying. One day when you grow up, you'll understand that everything your dad does is for you. He loves you so much. The next weekend rolled around, and as usual, I ran outside to wait for my dad. Just like the week before, the sun set and still he was nowhere to be seen. I was about to start crying when I noticed a man running towards our front door. My mom appeared and he said something, and suddenly my mom started panicking. She called out to me and said we had to go to Grandpa's place immediately. I had no idea what was happening, but for the next month, my grandpa took care of me because my parents didn't come home. I missed them so much, and whenever I asked when they were coming to get me, my grandpa just said, Happiness, they're busy working. Don't you worry. Just stay here and enjoy your time with me. Eventually, I got used to it. Then one morning, grandpa woke me up early and said it was time to go home. I was so excited that I kept on singing happily. As we pulled up outside our house, my heart started beating faster. I was home. Then a shadow appeared in the doorway, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was my mom and dad. But my dad was in a wheelchair. My mom looked so thin and tired, and my dad had no legs. What had happened? I looked to Grandpa to reassure me, but he looked as nervous as I did. Then in my little voice, I said, Daddy? Where are your legs? He smiled at me and with his usual loving eye said, They got hurt. But hey, what do you think of my wheelchair? He let me sit on his lap and mom pushed us around and it was so cool. I was way too young to understand what was really going on. All I remember was how many people kept visiting to check on dad and that I finally got to try a chocolate egg. That same day, a doctor came to visit and after he checked on my dad, he came over and patted my head. Then he pulled a chocolate egg out of his bag. And then another one. And another one. Three chocolate eggs. I couldn't believe it. I was shaking with excitement. The doctor said the gift was from my dad and that I should thank him. I ran to my dad and said, thank you, daddy. He looked like he was going to cry. And I asked if he was okay. And he just smiled and said, I'm happy because you're happy. That's all that matters to me. For the first time in my life, I got to try a chocolate egg, and it was the most delicious thing I'd ever tasted. And the best part was that inside there was a toy. After I opened and ate all three, I just wanted more. I kept asking my dad when I could get more, and he just laughed. And then I thought, maybe if I studied really hard and was a good girl, I'd get some more. So that's what I did. I focused on my study. And one day, I won a medal at school for winning a math contest. I was so excited to show my parents and assumed they'd give me a chocolate egg as a reward, but that's not what happened. They congratulated me, but said it wasn't possible for them to get me another chocolate egg. I don't know why, but this made me so angry. I cried, and I even threw my bag at them, and this made my mom super mad. She scolded me so much that I was scared and ran out the house and went to my grandpa's house. I cried and cried and told him everything, and my grandpa said, Happiness. The reason your mom got so mad is because she is under too much pressure and has to work so hard to look after you. Now, your dad can't work, so she's in charge, and it's a lot for her to deal with. Then he told me what happened to my dad, and it changed my life forever. That day when my dad was out doing his deliveries, he got an opportunity to do some overtime, which he jumped at the chance to do so he could buy me my chocolate eggs. On his way home, he stopped to buy them for me. And then because he was so tired, as he was leaving the store, he got hit by a drunk driver. He was hit so hard, he lost both his legs. I couldn't believe it. How could I have been so selfish? If it weren't for me demanding a chocolate egg, my dad would still have his legs. I felt so terrible. And so the next day, when I won some candy for the other math contests, I came home and went to my parents. Mommy, Daddy. I'm so sorry. I want you to have these. You always do your best to give me the sweetest life, and so I wanted to make yours sweeter too. That probably sounds a bit deep for a six-year-old to say, right? Well, my grandpa taught me that one. My parents were so moved, but they almost cried when they hugged me. And even though I didn't understand it at the time, I do now. And it's so true. 
It's taken me a while, but now that I'm about to move out, I finally understand the life my parents have given me and how sweet it has been. Through this channel, I'd like to send some words to my parents. Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, I want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've done for me. Now it's my turn to work hard and make you proud. No matter how hard life gets, I'll persevere, just like you both have, because I'm your happiness. Hi guys, I'm Chrissy, and my high school life took a drastic turn thanks to my crazy, overprotective mom. You see, my parents divorced when I was a little kid. I stayed with my mom, but she worked for the criminal investigation department, which meant she was super busy, so the house chores remained undone, and we lived off takeaways. Trust me, having pizza and egg fried rice every night isn't as good as it sounds. My grandparents could see that my mom was struggling to juggle her work and home life commitments, so I went to stay with them. I didn't mind this, as mom always visited me on weekends. Besides, grandma's meals are delicious. But then, mom switched departments. She went from chasing criminals to handling paperwork at the station. Due to these changes in circumstances, she had far more time on her hands, so I moved back in with her. It's only by living with her that I realized just how different she is to me. Talk about my opposite, as she's strong, fierce, and impulsive. Basically, she's like a man, while I'm a sweet girly girl who loves wearing pretty clothes and watching cute movies. You can imagine my horror when I invited my bestie, Sharon, over, and mom was walking around the house in a skull print tank top, ripped jeans, and biker boots. She looked like she was going on a bike rally. Yeah, this was just her usual style, but I was expecting she would at least act normal for once when we had a guest around. It was so cringe. She was almost 40, not 15. Then, on my first day of high school, mom insisted she take me there and pick me up, as she was worried there might be troublemakers on the bus. Yep, I know, this was ridiculous. I mean, how delicate does she think I am? But I didn't want to upset her, so I reluctantly agreed. School's out and I was chatting with my friends while waiting for my mom to show up when we suddenly heard the sound of a motorbike engine coming toward the school. Me and my friends got excited and whistled as we thought a cute guy was passing by. But then they stopped near us and took off their helmet. I literally wanted to faint. It was my beloved mother. Oh, sweet Jesus, what on earth was she doing? My mom shouted with joy. Hey, Chrissy, get on! Then she held a spare helmet out to me. I swear, it was like the whole school was outside watching us. How embarrassing! When we arrived home, I asked her where the bike had come from. She replied, What? Oh, you mean Eleanor? I just bought her last week. The weather is so nice today, so I thought I would bring her along. Yes, you heard her right. My mom named the bike after Eleanor Roosevelt. Unbelievable! The embarrassment didn't end there. Oh no. One day, my teacher informed us that tomorrow after school was a parent-teacher conference. I couldn't have mom turning up in a teenage rebel outfit, so I searched her closet for something mom-like. Nope. All my mom owned were t-shirts, ripped shorts, and crop tops. Ugh! So I went online and found this beautiful blue dress, then I told her to buy it. The next day after school, I waited for mom in my form room. All the parents were already there. Only my mom was missing. I was about to call her when suddenly somebody walked into the room. Oh. My. God. Someone, please knock me out right now. It was my mom. And you wouldn't believe what she was wearing. No, it wasn't the blue dress. Instead, it was this super skinny black leather dress black sunglasses, 10-inch high heels, and a black choker necklace. She looked like she belonged in a vampire movie. Everyone was gawping at her. I think some of the dads were even drooling a bit. When I confronted her about it, she just shrugged and said, Sweetie, this dress is much more my style than that mumsy blue one. Now this was officially my number one most embarrassing moment ever. Thanks, Mom. Why couldn't she be like me? I mean, 
I was starting to think that I was the adult here, not her. The embarrassment didn't end there. Instead, she took it to a whole new level. My school was planning a camping trip, and I was so excited about it. Mom wanted to come along and supervise, but I firmly said no. She started saying, but honey, you don't know how dangerous the woods are. What if you got bitten by a snake? Do you know how to handle that? I don't think so. What? She was just being ridiculous again. We argued for a while, but in the end, she agreed to let me go without her. The trip was so much fun, and some cute boys asked Sharon and me if we wanted to go for a swim in the lake. Of course, we said yes. I mean, look at them. They were so cute. Suddenly, I heard screaming. It was Sharon. She said someone was hiding in the bushes and watching us. That was so creepy. The cute boys said they'd go and check it out. But then this person jumped out of the bush and did a judo throw on them. Wait a minute. I know that move. Could it be? Oh, no. It was my mom. What was she wearing? She was in full army gear. She even had binoculars. Jeez, mom. What were you doing looking like a G.I. Joe? I couldn't hold my tears and I cried out, Oh my god, why can't you leave me alone? You're ruining everything! Then I ran back to the camp. She left after that, but I felt so embarrassed for the rest of the trip. When I returned home, my mom immediately said sorry to me and swore that something like that would never happen again. Okay, I could see in her eyes that she really meant it, so I would give her another chance. She calmed down a lot after that, and even let me go to school by myself. Well, that was big progress, don't you think? Soon after that, I started to date this boy named Kevin. And boy, was he hot! He was one of the popular kids at school, so I still couldn't believe he chose me. I don't know how Mom found out about him, but she did, and she insisted on inviting him over for dinner. I made her agree not to do anything crazy. I mean... What was the worst that could happen? The dinner was going well, until we got to dessert. Then mom started asking him awkward questions, like, Kevin, how many girls have you dated? And, I assume you two have health classes at school? Or should I remind you of some important facts? Oh, sweet Jesus, mom! Her questions were beyond embarrassing. Kevin just sat there with a super awkward smile on his face and didn't answer. But then mom announced it was very late and practically shoved him out of the house. Huh, it was only 8.30 p.m. After he left, I went straight to my mom and we started arguing. Mom, you agreed not to do anything crazy. Why can't you act like a normal mom? She replied, Oh, honey, that Kevin guy is really cute, but he's not good for you. I know his type. They only want to take advantage of girly girls like you. What? Girly girls like me? What was that supposed to mean? I shouted back. You're doing it again! You're being overprotective! That's because you're not tough enough! If you wouldn't be so girly and be a badass like your mom, I wouldn't have to protect you all the time. I stormed up to my room and slammed the door shut. I was so going to prove to her that she was wrong about Kevin and that I didn't need her protection. Fortunately, mom hadn't scared Kevin off. Phew! He told me that his parents were super embarrassing, too. One evening, Kevin took me to this nice restaurant. There were candles, live music, and the food was delicious. It was so romantic. Then he touched my hand and leaned in closer. This was so exciting. I was about to have my first kiss! Suddenly, someone banged on the table nearby and ruined the moment. That's when I noticed they had a keychain on their bag that looked exactly like the one I'd made once at summer camp. I stood up and walked toward the table. A middle-aged lady with blonde hair and sunglasses was sitting there. I tried to look at her face, but it was like she was avoiding me. I took a closer look, and I couldn't believe it. I ripped the wig off her head, and yes, it was my beloved mother, again! To be honest, I didn't want to argue with her anymore. Today was proof that she just couldn't change. So I just said in a calm voice, I hate you, mom. You're the worst mom ever. Then I grabbed Kevin's arm and ran out of there. Okay, maybe what I said was a bit harsh, 
but she just ruined what would have been my first kiss. I couldn't concentrate on our date after that, so I asked Kevin to take me home. But to my surprise, he drove me back to his place. Uh-oh, I knew what that meant. But I wasn't ready for any of that yet, so I told him I'd get an Uber. Suddenly, he grabbed my arm and tried to drag me into his house. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. Mom was so right about him. I was freaking out. But then suddenly, I remembered something important that she'd taught me, so I used her signature judo move on him. It worked, as he laid on the ground and groaned out in pain. Ha! Huh. And that's when my mom arrived on her motorbike. As soon as I saw her, I ran over to her, hugged her tight, and cried like a baby in her arms. You must be wondering how my mom found me. Well, when Kevin came by to have dinner, she pickpocketed his phone and hacked it so she had access to all his messages and location. So after I dragged him out of the restaurant, he texted his friends saying he was trying to get in bed with me at all costs, which my mom saw, so she rushed to rescue me. Oh God, mom, that was so not okay. But what could you expect from a criminal investigator? When we arrived home, we had a serious talk. To my surprise, she admitted that she was wrong about me. She saw now that I was able to take care of myself. That judo move I did on Kevin really impressed her. See? Girly girls can kick some butt too. So from that moment on, things between us improved lots. Turns out, my mom isn't so annoying after all. I realize now that she's pretty cool, and all the things she did were just to protect me. Okay, so maybe she took it to the extreme levels, but she did it with good intentions. Thanks to my mom, I feel stronger now. You know what they say, I'm a strong woman because a strong woman raised me. Although, one thing's for sure, I won't be borrowing her clothes anytime soon. Hi everyone, Jack here. I'm 17 and I live with my mom, dad, and sis. We're pretty much a normal family. I suppose I do okay at school. I'm not super popular or anything, as I am a little on the shy side, but I'm not unpopular either. I'm really good at sports studies, and I definitely want to pursue this further when I go to college and stuff. Anyway, I want to tell you about my best friend Danny, and the girl of my dreams, Amy. I first met Danny at the age of 10. We were both at the local pool, and back then, I was energetic, and well, I did a lot of stuff without thinking it through. I started splashing about in the pool, and soon I realized I couldn't put my feet on the ground. I couldn't swim. So, yeah, this was bad. I began to panic and tried shouting out for help, but a load of water ended up in my mouth. Then Danny appeared and helped me over to the shallow end. Turns out he was new to town and was starting at the same school that I went to. After that, we became best friends. Danny's this effortlessly cool, stylish, and handsome guy. He was always more popular than me, and all the girls liked him, but still, he chose to be friends with me. Being around him was great fun. We hung out and goofed around. There's this girl from school called Amy. She's popular and beautiful. She always wears these pretty dresses, and well, she just stands out. Problem is, I wasn't the only one to notice this. Practically every boy at school had a crush on her. I didn't think I stood a chance with her, but then the school picnic happened. I ended up in the same group as her, so I went over to her and tried to talk. I felt so nervous that I couldn't get any words out. Then I tripped over a branch and accidentally fell into her arms. In that moment, I imagined we looked into each other's eyes and she could see how much I liked her. Then we'd kiss and date and marry and live happily ever after. But yeah, that wasn't reality. In real life, I was stiff as a log and was so embarrassed. I quickly snapped out of it, got up and muttered out, sorry. She giggled and said, no problem. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. Amazingly, we started chatting after that. Things quickly changed between Amy and me. We talked a lot on Messenger and I often sat with her at lunch. She was so fun to be around and I loved spending time with her. Then we started dating. I often had to pinch myself to convince myself that yes, I really was dating the most beautiful girl in school. We both loved nature, so we often spent our weekends going for walks and exploring new places. Our first kiss happened in my room. 
We were meant to be working on our science project, but I couldn't stop staring at her. She was just so beautiful. So I leaned over and kissed her. It was like fireworks were going off around us. <laughs> Talk about magical. After that, we became pretty much inseparable. I often went out to restaurants with her family, and she regularly came over for dinner with mine. Things were amazing. She was my princess. With her around, I felt so happy, and I couldn't imagine my life without her in it. Then one night, she texted me, I love you. This made me smile, and I sent back, I love you too, Amy. Then, to my surprise, she messaged back, What is love anyway? I didn't understand what she meant, but before I can send another message asking this, she sent me a video of her with Danny, my best friend Danny. Then she messaged me, this is what real love looks like. Couldn't believe what I just saw. I immediately threw my phone across the room. I was so heartbroken. How could she do this to me and with my best friend? I cried days and nights. It was horrible. I felt like I'd never be happy again. I rarely cry, so my family was really worried and tried every way to console me, but nothing they said or did could cheer me up. Worse still, I was dreading going back to school and having to see them together. They didn't make it easy for me. As soon as I got to my locker, I saw them there, kissing. Word got around that they were very much in love. So much for her ever loving me. It hurt so much. Danny didn't seem to bother that he'd hurt me. That's the problem with Danny. He doesn't think sometimes. He just goes after what he wants without a care for who he stomps on in the process. Plus, we weren't as close as before anymore. Ever since high school started, he'd been hanging out with some bad guy. I told him that Amy was a liar and that she would soon go off him. But he just shrugged and said, whatever. I know you're probably wondering why I stayed friends with Danny after what he did. I guess I'm too nice, but I just couldn't break our seven-year relationship over this. It was bad enough I'd lost the love of my life. I couldn't afford to lose my best friend too. Yes, I felt betrayed and angry, but Amy had made her choice, and it wasn't me. Then one night, I was on my way home on the metro. The only free seat was next to Amy, so I sat down next to her. At first, it was awkward, and neither of us spoke. Then I asked her, why did you cheat on me? She replied, well, Danny's the richest, most popular, and best-looking guy in school. I only used you to get closer to him. This was horrible to hear. I was so mad that I chose to stand for the rest of the journey back. The next day, I tried telling Danny what Amy had said. He told me I was just being jealous, shoved me, and yelled at me that I needed to stop being so bitter. We didn't talk for two weeks after that. I felt so lonely, but it turns out neither Danny nor Amy were the people I thought they were. Danny tried calling, but I ignored his calls. He also sent me some lame apology messages, but I didn't reply. Then one day, he showed up on my doorstep, gave me chocolate, and asked me to go for a walk in the woods with him. I took my GoPro with me. As I said before, I love nature. I always film the scenery on my walks. I asked him if he truly loved Amy, and to my surprise, he said that girls were like chewing gum. You had to chew till the end and then spit them out. He said he would use Amy one last time, then finish with her, then let his friends have her. Then he would move to another city and do it all over again. This was shocking to hear. I knew he could be reckless, but I didn't think the boy who saved my life when we were 10 was capable of being so cruel. I told him I never wanted to talk to him again, and I stormed off. My GoPro had been recording the whole time. So it was about time I took revenge on my shattered heart, wasn't it? Thing is, as mean as Amy has been, I still care about her. I thought about it a lot and eventually decided that she deserved to know the truth. So I sent her the recording. Even after seeing it, she made out I'd edited it to make Danny sound bad, as I was just jealous. I knew that her parents thought she was so sweet and innocent, so I told her that if she didn't split up with Danny, I'd send them the video clip. She tried to resist at first, but soon she gave up and begged me not to show it to them. I later found out that she'd continued to see Danny in secret for weeks after that. But eventually, she saw the dark side to him. She even came up to me at school and thanked me for trying to help her and apologized for hurting me. I didn't try to save her from Danny because I was feeling sympathetic toward her or anything like that. Instead, I believe that witnessing a crime is as bad as committing it. I guess that as mean as Amy had been to me, I didn't want to see her hurt, especially not by that jerk. Actually, after that, she's even reached out to me once and asked me to be her boyfriend again. But of course, I wasn't a fool.
a leopard can't change its spots. So I made it clear to her that my answer was and would always be no, and that we should just stay friends. While me and Danny, we aren't friends anymore. I have other friends, but it's hard, as a part of me does still miss him, but I don't like the person he's become. Thanks for listening to my story. I hope that you guys don't go through what I did, but if you do, I hope you find the strength to do the right thing, however hard this may be. Hey, I'm Henry, and I'm a 23-year-old from Hamburg, and I have one question. You must have heard of K-pop, right? So, any K-pop fans in the house? Of course, I'm one. To be specific, I am an ARMY, a true BTS stan. Oh, and for those who don't know, stan is slang for when you're a big fan of something. Anyway, I can proudly say I'm obsessed with K-pop, and it's such a fun journey, right? But not everyone gets it. In fact, this is my story about how people treated me for being a fanboy, and it gets pretty dramatic. So, people always think that we like K-pop just because the idols are good-looking. But no, that's not only it. Seriously, I bet those who hate K-pop haven't even given it a proper listen. So you K-pop haters, just hear me out, and I'll start by tracing all the way back to the beginning of that life-changing moment when I first discovered K-pop. It all started when my classmate Chrissy was watching this music video called Dope during recess. I got curious and joined her. And oh boy, i never seen something so incredible before. The camera work, the choreography, it was unreal. I couldn't get the song out of my head, and the video was so much fun to watch. They didn't need hot girls nor supercars to make it eye-catching. It's pure talent only. After that, I started to listen to more K-pop and became a multi-stan, but BTS is always my one true love. I love them, and I wouldn't mind sharing all about it on my Instagram, which also helps me make friends with a lot of other ARMY from all around the world. Mostly girls, but a lot of guys too. And they often message me saying how much they admire me for being so open about my love for K-pop. They say they wish they had the same courage I did, since a lot of them got made fun of for liking Korean male artists. How ridiculous is that? It's 2021. We can like who we like, and we shouldn't have to keep quiet about our passions. However, I totally understood how they felt. I've been there, and it was rough. One time in high school, I'd been so excited to show Chrissy my new BTS album. We were screaming and squealing as I carefully flipped through each page as if it was my most prized possession, when some jock walked by with his crew and snatched it out of my hand. Then he said, What is this tween magazine? Didn't they all have plastic surgery? Right? Then another guy said, Why do you like these guys? Are you gay or something? Then they all walked off laughing. I was so angry I wanted to kick them so far off the earth, even Google wouldn't be able to find him. But I couldn't do anything. They were way bigger than me and would crush me into a pulp if I even tried. So I came up with a better idea. I started going to the gym. I wanted to be buff like June Kook. Then I wouldn't be afraid of any losers picking on me and my boys anymore. Oh, and by the way, I'm not gay. That's just another thing us fanboys have to deal with. There's nothing wrong with being gay, but just assuming I am because I like K-pop is silly. K-pop is for anyone and everyone. Anyway, after high school, things were looking up as people in college were less nosy. We'd all grown up, and you won't believe how muscular I'd become. Girls started showing interest in me, but there was only one girl I had eyes for. Her name was Kayla, and she was so cute. However, there was just one tiny problem. And by tiny, I mean huge. She didn't like K-pop. Once when we were studying, she sat closer to me and asked with a smile, What are you listening to? Then she took one side of my earphones. What is this? Some kind of chanting? Then she just went back to reading with a disgusted look on her face. What? That was my bias. Rap Monster was spitting fire. I didn't know she was that tasteless. But I let it slide this time, since I didn't want to make a big deal out of it in the library. After that, things got worse, and her hatred for K-pop became more obvious. Every time I talked about it, she rolled her eyes and changed the subject. And when the new music videos came out, and I couldn't wait to show her, she'd just scroll on her phone and ignore it. Other than that, she was always so sweet, and so we kept on dating. But we shouldn't have. One time, we were hanging out at the mall, and it was a pretty special day for me, as it was BTS's debut anniversary. 
I was so excited and had even worn my BTS crossbody bag with a Koya keychain to complete the look. I thought I looked cool, but Kayla burst out laughing when she saw me and said, OMG, did you borrow your sister's bag or something? I tried to explain to her and said, no, it's mine, and this is my baby Koya. But she just cut me off and rolled her eyes, as she said we'd be late for the movies. She kinda killed my vibe, but it was BTS day, so I wouldn't let anything ruin it. We were lining up to buy popcorn when I felt someone tap me on the shoulder. Excuse me, I couldn't help noticing your Koya. Are you perhaps an army? I finished his sentence with a scream. We were both excited. We basically talked in gibberish that probably only ARMY could understand. Turns out J-Hope was his bias, and his name was Craig. Then he even gifted me some photo cards he'd just printed out. I was so immersed in the conversation with him, I forgot Kayla was even there. Until Craig said to her, Oh, hey, who's your bias? I might have some cards for you too. Kayla looked offended and said, You guys are sick. What a pair of losers. I've had enough of this K-pop stuff. Then she stormed off. We were left stunned, but oh well. If she couldn't respect my hobby and love me for who I am, then fine. Good riddance, Kayla. After that, Craig and I went to a cafe to talk everything BTS. And until this day, we're still good friends. And I'm grateful he saved me from dating that awful girl any longer. After that relationship, I gave my love life a bit of a break. As I was busy with streaming music videos, voting for BTS on award shows, and catching up with all of their content, on top of studying. I was perfectly happy living my little fanboy life without any girl. But then one day, everything changed. I was on the bus to class, because I wasn't feeling well enough to drive after a white night watching BTS's live stream. I must have dozed off because the next moment I woke up, and I was leaning on some girl's shoulder. I quickly apologized to her, and she just giggled. Then I took a proper look, and oh my gosh, I've never met such a beautiful girl in my life. She was like a mixture of all four members of Blackpink. Luckily, I was smart enough to ask her for her number, and offered to buy her a drink to make up for almost drooling on her shoulder. After class, we met at a Starbucks and immediately hit it off. Her name was Clara, and she was so smart and pretty, I gotta make her mine. So I decided to change my tactic a little. I would wait a bit before telling her I was a fanboy. And instead, I focused on finding out more about her first and making it clear I really liked her. Then, when the right time came, I'd share with her my passion for K-pop. Pretty soon, we got quite serious and did everything together, and I finally felt the moment had come. I was driving her home and decided to put my K-pop playlist on. To my surprise, she looked interested and asked what it was. I told her how much I loved it, and then nervously asked her, Are you really okay with it? Because usually when I tell people, they make fun of me. She just smiled and said, Okay, now it's my turn. Then she put on some death metal, which almost made my hair stand on end. She laughed and said, I know how you feel. Death metal isn't everyone's cup of tea either. But hey, we're allowed to like whatever we want, right? I respect that you love K-pop. Oh my gosh, could Clara be any more perfect? I can't wait to show her my room too. But unexpectedly, on the night I invited her over, her face changed as she saw all my posters and merch. I showed her my collections, my dolls, my pictures, but she just smiled and stared at me. Then she took my hand and said, Henry, this is really cool, but don't you think it's a bit much? I know you love them, but you should maybe start spending your money on stuff for your future, too. Then she told me she wanted to go home. Can't deny that I was hurt, but I knew that she's the one for me, and she just needed a little time to really understand that this was more than just a hobby for me. So I was determined to get her to like K-pop. I started sending her songs and recommending her some Korean shows to watch. Once, I even pretended I was taking her out for a picnic, but I took her to an army fest. Clara went along with it all, but she didn't seem too interested. Then came the best news ever. I found out BTS was going to have a concert in London. I was desperate to go and told Clara about flying there for the concert, but she said, Henry, isn't that the same day as our marketing contest? There will be headhunters there and everything. You can't miss it. This is your chance to secure a good job. I didn't care and replied with a joke, but I've been waiting to see them my whole life. This is a dream come true. Who needs a job when you have BTS? I'm going to London, baby. But Clara didn't laugh. In fact, she got super angry and started shouting at me saying that I was so immature and that if I didn't grow up soon, she couldn't be with me anymore. She was even crying, saying she needed a responsible man who was thinking about his future as she stormed off. After that, she gave me the silent treatment. 
I was stuck in a dilemma. It was my biggest dream to see BTS live. But why did this feel so wrong? I decided to wait a few days to think it all through. And eventually I realized there would be other concerts, right? I really couldn't skip the contest. I mean, how else would I support BTS without money? I did need a job. So even though it broke my fanboy heart, I told Clara I'd skip the concert this time and go to the contest. Clara immediately grinned and said, Really? I'm so proud of you, Henry. Then she gave me a big kiss, and I reminded myself this was all worth it. And at least I still had my girlfriend. But suddenly Clara started speaking again. Henry, there's something I need to tell you. Um, actually, Professor Geller has told me that the contest has been put off temporarily. So... This was just a test. Then she said she just wanted to see if I could figure out my priorities. She loved how passionate I was about K-pop, but everything needed balance, and she wanted to make sure I would take other parts of my life as seriously as I took K-pop. Then she handed me her phone and said, Look, I couldn't believe it. It was two tickets to the BTS show. She'd bought them for me. I was so happy I burst into tears and couldn't stop hugging her. I thought that was the happiest moment of my life. But... The BTS concert was, especially as Clara was by my side. We're currently still together, and guess what? She even biases Jin now. She's seriously the perfect girl for me, and I can't wait to spend my life with her. If in 2031 you ever see a family of four screaming their heads off at a BTS concert, chances are it's me and Clara and our future kids. Don't be shy. Come say hi. So everyone loves Christmas, right? Trust me, it's not so great when your boss fires you in November. How was I supposed to buy presents now? Still, I tried to see the positives. I hated that boring, underpaid, overworked job anyway. My ex-boss Adrian was the worst. He's a crazy perfectionist who always gave me ridiculous deadlines, complained about every tiniest mistake, and flipped out if things didn't go his way. No wonder he was still single at 32. Who could ever stand him? I wouldn't miss him, or my tragic ass-kissing co-workers. Anyways, on the bright side, I'd get to spend the entire holiday season with my family and my boyfriend Mac in peace, without being bothered by any annoying work emails. I, in fact, have invited Matt over for Thanksgiving dinner with my parents and plan to spend this cozy weekend with my loved ones. Then, the day before Thanksgiving, I packed up my car and was about to go and pick Matt up when my phone beeped. Sonia, I don't think Thanksgiving is a good idea. I just think we need some time apart. Hope you have a great time. See you around. X. What? Had he just broken up with me over text message? I immediately rang him up, but he'd turned his phone off. Just great. Here I was, stuck at home for the entire Thanksgiving and Christmas period, being a jobless, boyfriendless loser. To make it worse, even my little sister Gina had a boyfriend who adored her. This is so unfair. One night, my parents were out to buy a Christmas tree, and Gina had her boyfriend over to help put up Christmas lights and decorations. Well, needless to say, love was in the air, and that festive vibe didn't help at all with my misery. So I refused to join them and curled up in my room. Feeling so lonely and miserable, I downloaded Tinder. I usually wasn't one for dating apps, but I was feeling so low, I would have happily spoken to anyone. I didn't feel like being me. I was sick of being me, so I used the fake name Crystal and just put some artsy scenery pictures up. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And you know what? It seemed to be working, as a few guys wanted to talk to me. Okay, most of them were also bored, or only after one thing, but then there's this guy called Carl that caught my attention. Like me, he had no pictures of himself, but instead, he had images of song lyrics and movie quotes, including the quote, The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I love the movie Lost in Translation, so I sent him a message telling him he had good taste in films, and he messaged me back complimenting the scenery photos I took. After that, we started chatting days and nights. We talked about everything, from the dumb to the meaningful. He actually helped me out a lot and made the Christmas period bearable for me. It was all going great, until Christmas Eve. He sent me a message to wish me a Merry Christmas, along with, let's meet up for a drink. Oh no. 
Even though the app said he was only a few miles away, I wasn't ready for meetups. I actually was nervous upon reading his text. My heart was pounding, and I found myself worrying about what he would think of me when we met. What if he didn't look like what I imagined? What if he'd be disappointed when he saw me? Why does that even matter, though? Unless I developed feelings for him. I don't even know anymore. But it's certain that I couldn't face him just yet. I politely refused his invitation. He was cool about it. Then we still continued to talk like normal. I survived Christmas. And then for New Year's Eve, Gina persuaded me to go to a party with her boyfriend and friends. I wasn't really keen to join, but I guessed I needed to do something to stop this gloominess. As I was walking in, I was so busy brushing off the snow on my shoulder that I bumped into a guy. To my horror, I looked up and saw that it was my old boss, Adrian. Why was he here, in my hometown? He was also shocked, but managed to smile at me. But I just gave him a glare, rolled my eyes, flipped back my hair, then strode off. What a mood killer! I grabbed a drink and sat in the corner in an attempt to avoid bumping into Adrian again. Gina found me and tried dragging me onto the dance floor, but I refused. Then she winked at me and in a tipsy voice said, You need a man to dance with. I'll be right back. Five minutes later, she excitedly waved at me and shouted over, Found one! I just want to facepalm as I saw her dragging Adrian by the hand over to me. Talk about awkward. But still, I mumbled out a hi, downed a shot for courage, and then chatted to him. Okay, it turns out he was visiting his grandparents who lived around here, and he was actually an okay guy to talk to. After I spent most of the night talking to him, he bought a drink, then said to me, I have to admit that after the death stare you gave me on entry, I was afraid for my life. But it turns out, I've enjoyed chatting with you. Sorry, I blushed. No, it's okay. I'd be mad with me too if I were you. Letting you go from work was nothing personal. I had to let one person go, and I only chose you because I knew you were wasted there. Um, thanks, I guess, I laughed. Let's get another shot. Okay, so maybe Adrian wasn't that bad of a person after all. And I don't know if it's because of all the drinks we downed, the atmosphere, or the fact that everyone else around us was sharing New Year's kisses, that I almost felt like Adrian looked like he wanted to kiss me on the strike of midnight too. And I too didn't dodge it. Luckily, nothing happened. I mean, that would have been weird, right? The next day, Adrian messaged me, saying he would help me set up a job interview at a big media company. Wow, that's amazing! Now I had no excuse to sulk around anymore. I needed to get back to the city and sort my life out. Only, I still couldn't get Carl out of my head. I guessed these feelings were real. To clear up my mind, I decided to confess to him online. But then he messaged me back saying, I think you're great and I love talking to you, but I have a crush on my coworker. I'm sorry, but I'd like to stay friends. Ouch! Rejection hurt! Back in the city, I felt lonelier than ever. Yes, I'd got the new job and it was going well, but I was sick of seeing loved up couples everywhere. To make it worse, Gina came to stay with me for a while and she's always on the phone, giggling and FaceTiming her boyfriend. Now I couldn't even escape lovebirds in my own apartment. Feeling down, I messaged Carl again, just casually asked him to meet up later this weekend when I would be back home again for my mom's birthday. Well, to be honest, I just couldn't give him up just yet. Maybe he would change his mind when we met, or I would be able to get over him once we meet. But he made up some excuse to reject me again. That was it, I told myself. It's official over now. Depressed, I called Adrian up for a drink. He arrived looking kinda cute, but the sting of rejection was still on my mind. I confided to Adrian, and I asked him if he thought Carl was a fool for turning me down. Adrian slammed his drink onto the table and turned to me and said, You're the fool. Why are you stupidly chasing after some guy online? He might not even be real. He might be some 60-year-old pervert. Why won't you just open your eyes and look in front of you? Then he stood up, locked me in his arms, and tried to kiss me. What? I was so mad I pulled myself away from him and slapped him straight across the face before I stomped off. He was meant to be my friend, not some guy after just one thing. I was so hurt, I cried while texting Carl about what just happened, but he didn't reply. The next day, I woke up with a pounding head and puffy eyes. I checked my phone. Adrian had called me, but nothing from Carl. He must have been too busy with his coworker, huh? Suddenly, I heard the door knock. My sister answered it and told me it was Adrian. 
I reluctantly went out to see him. I mean, I guess I needed to at least hear him out. He was standing there looking sheepish as he said, I'm so sorry about last night, Sonia. I was slightly drunk and I guess I've read the signals wrong. For what it's worth, I think that Carl guy is a fool for letting you go. You're amazing. I wasn't in the mood to talk to him, so said it was fine, then told him to leave. I closed the door and threw myself on the sofa. Then about ten minutes later, there was someone at the door again. I answered it, and there was Adrian, but this time, he changed his outfit. Confused, I grumbled. What else do you want? Then, he politely greeted me. Hello, Crystal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Carl. We've been talking for months. I guess, if you think about it... The more you know who you are, and what you want, the less you let things upset you. I stared at him open-mouthed. He just quoted Lost in Translation, and he'd called me Crystal. Then reality struck me. OMG! All this time, and Adrian was Carl? I dragged him inside. We sat down on the sofa and talked everything out. It's so unreal! Turns out the guy I've been chasing after is literally right in front of me. How ironic! I was so happy I hugged him and broke down crying, apologizing. Right then, my sister walked out from the kitchen, took one look at us, and laughed out, Well, 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 isn't this the awful boss who fired you? But most importantly, isn't he the guy I brought to you at the New Year's Eve party? You two owe me big time. We all burst out laughing. So, yeah, after a horrid holiday season... Now I finally could start a promising new year with a great job and a pretty awesome new boyfriend. I guess things always have a way of working out in the end, right? Thank you for listening to my story, and wish you guys a good start into the new year! It was March 31st. A normal day, right? Well, yeah, but not tomorrow. Nope. As it was April Fool's Day. A prankster like me waits all year for that one day when I can play jokes on people without them getting in a mood with me. I've been planning my tricks for months. And boy, oh boy, it's going to be so much fun. <laughs> I turned to my best friend Aya and said with a devious smile, Just you wait until tomorrow. My prank ideas are going to be legendary. I thought Aya would want to know more, but nope. She just blew her fringe out of her face, then sighed out, Floor, why don't you just give it a rest this year? Reality check. No one finds your pranks funny. Only uncomfortable and annoying. What? No way. That's not true. People love my pranks. Aya continued, Do you remember your pencil prank on Luna last year? I nodded and let out a snort. How could I forget that prank, as it had been so funny? I'd cut Luna's pencil in half, filled her pencil grip with ink, then assembled it back together just like new. And voila! Cue an ink explosion during an otherwise boring test. Luna cried a lot because she failed her biology test and had to retake it. I shrugged. So this was technically true, but it was still funny. And the time you swapped the cheerleading team's chant music for heavy metal and made a fool out of them at the basketball match? She frowned at me. Jeez, stop being a fun killer. I'm making everyone's high school experience memorable. As, let's face it, no one will remember boring tests and tedious basketball matches otherwise. I was too busy talking to notice the ball whizzing through the air until it whacked me right on the head. Ouch. The world went black, and I collapsed. I opened my eyes to see Aya and some other kids gawping down at me. Then my teacher rushed over and shooed them off. Fleur, are you okay? Her and Aya helped me sit up, and while I rubbed my head, I replied, Yeah, I'm fine, but I do feel a little dizzy. The teacher thought it would be best if I went home early, so she told Aya to take me back. I was so tired but I knew sleeping when I might have a concussion was a bad idea, so I chilled out and watched a movie in my room until mom came home from work. Okay, so my head hurt and the room was still spinning, but there was no way I was going to let this small accident ruin my big day. I had planning to do, so I grabbed my notebook and checked through my prank ideas and prop list. 
The next morning, I woke up bright and early. And yay! The spinning had stopped. Whoa, today was the day. Let the pranking commence. I told Aya to meet me earlier, so I had time to set up my pranks. But to my annoyance, she showed up at the usual time. I hurried over to her and tapped my watch. What time do you call this? Now I'm going to be behind schedule. She gave me a puzzled look. For what? It's not April 1st anymore. Today is the 2nd. You had yesterday off because of your head bump, remember? What? What are you talking about? Look, it says today is April 1st. I waved my phone in her face. Then your calendar is wrong. Check your settings or something. Now, let's go. She walked off. No way. Don't think you can fool me, I said while trying to run after her. As soon as I arrived at school, I joined my friends in the canteen for breakfast, and Kelly looked at me and said, How's the head? I told her it was fine and passed her an Oreo. You know what? She ate it with no hesitation, but after one bite, she spat it into her hand. Ew, what is that? Yuck! I laughed at her and said, Ha! That's toothpaste sandwiched between Oreo biscuits. Okay, I'm sorry. Drink this. Then I passed her a bottle of cola. She took a big gulp, then immediately spit it out. Hey, this is so gross. Then she ran to the bathroom to clean her mouth. Yep, I put soy sauce in that bottle. <laughs> I followed her to the bathroom to check on her and found her rinsing her mouth out under the tap. When she finished, she frowned at me and said, Fleur, this isn't funny. I thought you only did these stupid pranks on April 1st. Now I have to put up with my stinky soy sauce breath all day. I rolled my eyes then smirked. Yeah, as if it's not April 1st today. It's not. What's wrong with you? It's the second. Then she stormed off. Wait, what? What did she mean it was the second? No way. Anyways, seeing as I was already in there, I decided I may as well carry out another prank. I pulled out my Nutella jar and went into one of the cubicles and waited until another girl went into the one next door. I asked her, Hey, excuse me, my friend, do you have toilet paper in there? She was nice and replied, Sure. Then she passed it to me. I quickly put some Nutella on my hand, then rubbed it over her hand too. Oops. Oh boy. She screamed so loudly and I couldn't hold my laugh. Ew, what the hell? So disgusting, you freak. Then she ran out to wash her hand. I stepped out. Relax, girl. It was just a prank for Fool's Day. Just Nutella. But she sneered back. You're crazy. And it's the second already. Jeez, what's wrong with you? Then she left. Okay, this was so weird. Why was everyone acting like it was April 2nd? On the way to class, I rechecked my phone. Yep, it said April 1st. Okay, I got it. This was everyone's dumb attempt to fool me. Well, nice try, but it so wasn't working. As it was the first, which meant it was time for math class. I took my seat in class and waited, but... Huh? Why did Mr. Simmons, the chemistry teacher, walk in? He told us to prepare for our next lesson in the lab. Huh? What was going on? I was so confused. That was tomorrow's schedule. Right? Then he sat down in the chair without any suspicion and... <laughs> a big fart sound came. I laughed so much my sides hurt. I couldn't believe it. I do this every year, but they fall for it each time. But hang on, why was everyone so quiet? I looked around and realized I was the only one laughing. Oh... Come on, everybody. It was fun. The typical joke for April Fools. Mr. Simons held up the fart pillow and gave me a stern look. Fleur, I don't expect this behavior from someone your age, especially seeing as it's not even April Fool's Day anymore. And can you believe it? All my classmates agreed with him. No way. Everyone was crazy. No, it is. I know it is. You're all lying. I replied in a panic before I gathered up my stuff and ran out of the classroom. I really needed some space to think this through. It was all so crazy. 
I couldn't have zoned out for an entire day. Could I? Or the ball hit me so hard that I lost my memory? I remember having dinner, then staying up late to plan out my pranks, and I know I was tired, but no way. They were the crazy ones, not me. Anyway, lab time. I was the last one to walk in, and I sat down at my bench and started on the experiment. I guess I wasn't focusing properly, as I poured the chemical into the beaker, and boom! The next thing I knew, I was covered in this weird green powder stuff. Still, no one was laughing. Instead, they were all staring at me and asking if I was okay. Then Mr. Simons asked them all, Why is this chemical bottle here? What a mistake! Embarrassed, I ran to the bathroom to clean my face. Jeez, I looked like the Grinch. It was super tricky to scrub off. Ugh, I hoped I wouldn't be stuck with this color forever. But was it someone's prank on me? But if that's the case, then why did no one laugh? I sure would have laughed at me if I was them. Finally, the green powder started to come off. And then I went back to class. On top of my backpack was a folded up note with my name on it. Huh. I opened it. Hi, Fleur. There's something important I want to tell you. Meet me in the hall after class. Devin. X. My heart instantly fluttered. I'd had a crush on Devin for, like, forever. But... Oh... I got this. This had to be a prank. Everybody knew I liked him, so they did all of this to embarrass me. Devin must be involved this time. I glanced over at him, and he smiled, then gave me this cute wave. Whatever, this was definitely too good to be true. Enough. I wasn't going to let everyone laugh at me anymore. So, as I followed Devin to the hall, I took a sip of water, but I kept it in my mouth. Then, when Devin stopped walking and turned to face me, I squirted the water up into the air like an elephant, then said, Ha! Gotcha! I'm no fool. He wiped his face onto the back of his sleeve, then looked me straight in the eye and said, Floor, I have feelings for you. I waited until today to tell you, as I didn't want to do it yesterday on April Fool's Day, as you'd probably think it was a joke. So why do that to me? I stared at him speechless. The highlighted words that I'd heard were feelings, yesterday, and April Fool's Day. I started laughing a fake laugh, but then it turned awkward, because his serious expression didn't budge. You're kidding, right? I muttered out, but he looked totally devastated. Oh no, I didn't want to upset Devin. I was just confused with days and... Ugh, as if I actually missed April Fool's Day. What a bummer! I realized my prank had gone too far, and how it could have hurt his feelings, so I blurted out, Devin, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. It's the concussion. I, I'm delirious. I'm so sorry. Then came an awkward silence. Suddenly, Devin's sad look changed into a smirk, and he began to laugh. Then everyone jumped out of nowhere and started laughing too. I stood there with a gormless expression on my face. Then Aya appeared and said, Gotcha! So, it turns out, it was actually April the 1st, and I hadn't actually missed a day. Nope, this was Aya's ingenious idea for everyone to get their own back on me. Last night, she created a group on Facebook and added everyone in the class, including the teachers, to plan today's prank. No, this couldn't be possible! I was the pranking queen, not them. Then Aya sidled up to me and said, Hey Fleur, guess what? It's still April Fool's Day. The next thing I knew, I was grinning at her. Then I play hit her arm and started to laugh. I guess that they had fooled me good. After that, I didn't carry out any more pranks. I was just happy to have a chilled rest of the day. Then, when I was walking home, Devin caught up with me and said, Floor, I'm sorry. Um, but actually, not everything was a joke today. I smiled and looked at him. Oh yeah? So, what's not a joke? But he just turned tomato red, then rushed away. I stood there blushing as I watched him hurry off. Did this mean Devin really likes me? Hmm, interesting. Maybe this April Fool's Day wasn't such a fail after all.
I was on my way to Julia's house for a study sesh when out of nowhere I found myself flying onto the ground. I was so stunned I didn't even see the ball that had hit me or the fact there was a cute guy rushing over to check if I was okay. He helped me up and apologized. Then he pulled a band-aid out of his bag. Oh my, who is he? I'd scraped my hand pretty badly, but I almost didn't mind because now I was face to face with a gorgeous guy. In fact, I was so busy staring at him and blushing that I didn't even notice Julia marching towards us. Um, what are you two doing? Turns out the cute guy was Callum, Julia's boyfriend. Ugh, Julia, of course. Every nice thing is always hers. I'm Jenny, by the way, and that lucky girl is Julia. She's the daughter of the richest guy in town, Mr. Walsh. We're supposed to be friends, but we honestly have nothing in common. I mean, my family is pretty poor. It's not our fault, though. My dad sadly passed away, and so it's just me and my mom trying to make ends meet. Julia, on the other hand, has a silver spoon shoved down her throat. But fate still brought us together. I know it's kind of wrong, but that night I couldn't stop thinking about Callum. He now, in fact, gave me motivation for the next study session with bossy Julia, as maybe he would be there again. I even put on makeup and skipping on the way to her house the next day. But, well, it was all for nothing, because Callum was nowhere to be seen. Instead, I had to sit and listen to Julia go on and on about her trip to Paris. I pretended that I was okay, but actually, I always dreamed of visiting the city of light and gazing up at the Eiffel Tower ever since watching Emily in Paris. Dream on, Jenny. Anyway, Julia was incessant. She loved making me look like a fool, and even said, Aw, poor Jenny. Maybe one day you'll get to go to Paris. But until then, you can just look at all my photos. Honestly, why was she so cruel to me? Last year around my birthday, she'd even shown me a fashion magazine and asked me which dress I liked best. I thought she was buying gifts for me, but instead, she showed up at my party in the exact dress I pointed out. I couldn't believe it. She just winked at me and laughed, and I seriously wanted to scream at her. Anyway... After looking at about one billion Paris pics, Mr. Walsh appeared. He looked happy to see us sitting so close and studying together. If only he knew the truth. But I had to pretend I had a lot of fun with Julia and helping her study, at least for his sake. Mr. Walsh was a good friend of our family, and ever since my dad passed away, he'd been looking out for me, and was even paying my school fees. I couldn't let him down. But you know what? I actually started to get excited to go over to Julia's now, as the thought of bumping into Callum again gave me butterflies. I even got myself a new hairstyle, but he was never there, and I always left feeling disappointed. Then one time, after school, it started to rain dogs and cats, and I had to run for it. Then suddenly, I felt an umbrella over my head. Guess what? It was Callum coming to the rescue. It was like something out of a romantic movie. He even offered me a lift home. My heart was racing so hard, I was afraid he'd hear it. I just sat there in silence, dripping rain all over his clean car. I even caught him looking over at me a few times, and my heart felt like it was going to leap out of my chest. He pulled up at my house, so I was about to get out when he touched my arm and said, Can I get your number? I was confused. I mean, wasn't he Julia's boyfriend? He then explained that he was just hired to be her fake boyfriend so that all the flirty boys would get out of her way. Wow, I couldn't believe it. He asked me to keep it a secret, as Julia would end us both if this story got out. Okay, it all made sense now. That's why he never came over to her house. I felt so happy. Over the next few days, Callum and I chatted a lot on the phone. And then eventually, he asked me out on a date. We went to the fun fair, and right away he held my hand. It made me feel so special, and I never wanted him to let go. We were having so much fun. Then a familiar voice pierced the air. Well, well, well. Isn't that my dear friend, Jenny? I felt dread rush through my whole body. We turned around, and there was Julia and her girl gang all standing there with their arms crossed. Callum dropped my hand and rushed to Julia's side. It was all her, babe. You gotta see the messages she sent. She's been flirting with me for weeks. It's pathetic. Whoa, was he for real? A second ago, he was about to lean in for a kiss. And now he was bad-mouthing me? How could he be so two-faced? I tried to explain to Julia, but she wouldn't listen. 
she just called me a traitor in front of everyone and told all her friends to lock up their boyfriends in case I try it on with one of theirs next. I was devastated. Everyone was staring at me and judging me. Ugh, if only I could vanish into thin air right now. And as I was thinking about where I could escape to, a guy appeared, grabbed my wrist, and pulled me away. It was Stefan, the guy who lived across the road from me. I didn't understand why he helped me, but I was so grateful that he did. He walked me home and tried to cheer me up by saying how his mom used to love our bakery so much, and that the carrot cake my mom made was his mom's fave. This made me smile, thinking back on all those happy times in our family bakery. When my dad had died, we'd had to sell it to pay off some debt, and life had become quite difficult. Luckily, Mr. Walsh was helping out, but after what just happened with Julia, I wasn't sure I'd be able to face him. The next day at school, everyone was staring at me. I couldn't even find a place to sit at lunch. What had I done? I'd ruined everything. And then it got worse. My phone beeped. It was Mr. Walsh. He said he was so disappointed in me and that I no longer needed to come and tutor his daughter. I wanted to cry, and at the same time, I felt so much relief. But then I read on, and he said, I'm sorry, but I can't keep my promise anymore. I'll continue to subsidize your school fees, but you'll have to figure something out for college. Good luck. My heart plummeted. Not only had I been shunned by everyone at school and backstabbed by Callum, but now the door to college was being slammed in my face, too. What would I do? My life was over. I felt so sick. I just walked out of the canteen and went home. I didn't dare go to school over the next few days. I was miserable. And just when I'd given up all hope, there was a knock at my door. It was Callum. What was he doing here? He said he was sorry for what had happened and that he missed me so much. Then he asked me if I'd be interested in being his secret girlfriend. What in the world? I was so angry, I wanted to slam the door in his face. But he was fast enough to catch my hand, which took me aback. At that exact moment, Stefan happened to walk past. Seeing me standing there with Callum, his face changed and he immediately walked away. Oh, no. I definitely couldn't let him misunderstand anything about me anymore. He's the only friend I had left. I yanked my arm away from Callum and chased after Stefan. I finally caught up with him and blurted out how I'd been feeling like the whole world was against me and that I didn't know what to do. He told me to calm down, then we went to sit on a bench in the park, as he let me confide everything in him. By the time I finished talking, I was on the verge of tears. Then he said, Listen, Jenny, you're better than this. Don't dim to fit in with those people at your school. Good people will see you for the real you. You're strong, and you can get through anything. I know you can. He was right. I was better than this. I didn't need to sink as low as Julia and her friends, and I certainly didn't need to rely on Mr. Walsh's money. I'd figure this out by myself, like I always did. So I applied for a part-time job at a coffee shop. Earning my own money felt so good. Suddenly I felt free, and I knew everything was going to be okay. But then one day when I was working, Julia and her gang came in. They still weren't over what happened, and in front of everyone, they brought up what I'd done to humiliate me. And they even recorded it, and I couldn't stop shaking. This was too much. That's when I threw a cup of coffee all over Julia and ran out of there. Julia shouted after me that she was going to tell my mom everything I'd done. Without a doubt, Julia really did it. She even sent my mom photos of me and Callum at the fair. And well, my mom didn't take it well. I rushed home to try and explain after mom yelled at me over the phone. But then I couldn't find mom anywhere. I called her phone and a man answered. He said my mom was in a hospital after she fainted? Oh dear good God! I got to the hospital immediately and found out that she had collapsed from shock. But thankfully she was okay. She had to stay in the rest of the day to be monitored. So I went to get us both a cup of coffee. That's when I saw him. Callum. He was in the ward next door sitting with some girl. I almost dropped the coffee out of shock. They looked close. I waited until he'd left, and then I went to ask the girl if Callum was her boyfriend. Well, turns out, they'd been dating for two years already. So he was triple cheating? The girl deserved to know the truth, so I took a deep breath and told her everything. She was so upset. We decided to get our own back. So the girl called Callum and asked him to come back. As soon as he arrived, we confronted him and got the truth once and for all. He was never Julia's real boyfriend. 
In fact, here's the shocking part. He was hired by Julia to pretend to date me and ruin my life. Apparently, she was jealous of how much attention her dad gave me since my dad had died, and that her dad constantly compared her to me. He kept apologizing to his girlfriend, saying how much he loved her, and that he only agreed to help Julia so that he could earn some money to help pay for her medical bills. I was stunned. Callum was so apologetic and said he'd come clean about everything. He posted it on the school forum to clear my name and to everyone to see the ugly truth about Julia. And of course, when Mr. Walsh saw it, he made her come and apologize to me. And he also apologized himself and offered to pay my college fees again. Do you think I accepted his offer? Of course not. I was standing on my own feet now, and there was no going back. I didn't need anyone's help. So you might be wondering how I could afford college. Surely not on my coffee shop salary, right? Well, after graduating high school, I realized how much I missed the bakery. That was where I truly felt happy. So I decided to study to become a pastry chef, and now my mom and I have opened a new bakery. I've never been happier. And there's one last thing I want to share. Oh, in fact, here he is. Hey, Stefan, I've made your mom's fave. Let's go surprise her. I couldn't stop smiling as Stefan took the carrot cake, kissed my cheek, and we headed for his car. Life is so much more simple now, and sweet, and I love it. Hey! Been trying to find you at school today. I have big news, and it's bad. Real bad! Don't leave me hanging! Mom says we're defo moving to California by the end of the month! What? No way! That's a two-day drive from here! Yeah, I know! <sighs> but Mom's marrying David. The same David that's scared of spiders, cockroaches, and everything? Yeah, that guy. He's been trying to get her attention for ages, sending her flowers, playing the guitar on her porch. Then last week, he even climbed up the oak tree so he could hand her flowers through the bedroom window. Okay, that's kind of creepy. Ew. Tell me about it. But you know, the worst part is, I have to transfer to another school. No, no, no. Lisa couldn't move away. Who would I sit with at lunch? Who would I watch corny movies with? Ugh, we've been besties for years. We couldn't just be separated like this. No one would ever understand me like she did. We were like two halves of a whole. Her dad had passed away, so she only had her mom, while I only had my dad. And yep, that's my amazing dad. It's been just me and him for the past 10 years. I still remember that afternoon when my mom took her suitcase and left with another man. After that, me and dad moved back here, to our hometown, New Hampshire. It's only when I got a little older that I found out mom and her lover scammed dad out of everything. So dad's been working his butt off to open his own repair garage to provide for us both ever since. It isn't fair. My dad's a hero, and he deserves to be with a better woman. Hold on. Yes, he deserves a better one. And who wouldn't be better than Lisa's mom? I needed to tell Lisa about my plan right now. So I immediately ran to my room and phoned her. Girl, I have the most genius plan ever to keep you and your mom here with me. Please, I'm all ears. Anything. I really don't want to move to Cali. Okay, listen. Let's set your mom up with my dad. He's a good guy. And that means we'll be sisters. We both squealed excitedly. Lisa always wanted to have a dad. A nice one. Not that David creep. Ugh. I could see the envy in her eyes when I spoke about the funny pranks I played on my dad. Well, in contrast, my heart ached whenever she told me about the girly pamper days she had with her mom. <sighs> okay, first, research is important. We spent all night looking up their horoscopes, name astrology calculator, and even physiognomy. Whoa, they're a 98% match! But hey, nothing is perfect, right? Me and Lisa would make up for the missing 2%. The next day, we were both zombies due to the lack of sleep. But at least a proper plan had been set. I told Lisa to tell her mom, Mary, to come around on Saturday for my birthday. Um, yeah, it's not actually my birthday. 
but she's a presenter for a big news channel, so she's super busy. We needed to make up some special occasion so she couldn't say no. Then I told my dad to prepare his signature dish to welcome my special guests. There's no way Mary could resist. That day, I was helping dad with the ingredients when I heard the doorbell. I opened the door to see Lisa standing there with a pink frosted birthday cake. And by her side was her mom. Happy birthday, sweetie. This one's for you. Oh, something smells good. Hmm, and so familiar. She continued. Hello? Mary? Jack? Why are you here? For Aaron's birthday. And you? I'm her father. And FYI, today isn't her birthday. Yeah, jerk. Mary said under her breath while rolling her eyes. Excuse me? You dumped me for no reason. So what's that attitude? Oh, really? For no reason? My eyes darted from dad to Mary. Huh? Why were they yelling at each other? This was very confusing, but I could guess that they used to date? OMG, what a small world! Okay, whatever, cause it's lunchtime now. And wow, Dad's legendary meatloaf smelled amazeballs. We sat down, and Mary glared at Dad as she took a bite of food. Then she blurted out, Oh wow, I guess some things never change, huh? Your food is still super salty. Oh really? But as I recall, someone still asked for seconds. Unbelievable! Excuse me, but do you know each other? Lisa innocently interrupted. There was an awkward silence, then Dad said, Yeah, we do. But this is the first time I've seen Mary since we broke up, right after I visited her studio for the first time. Mary looked flustered as she replied, Lisa, you shouldn't have tricked me into coming here. Finish your food, then we're leaving. On hearing this, Dad ordered Lisa and me up to my room so he could talk to Mary in private. Only, we hid behind the couch and listened in. Turns out, on that day, Mary took my dad to the studio to watch her first filming as a news presenter. After that, she'd passed by the waiting room and overheard Dad talking to someone. I clearly heard that person ask you how I looked, and you said I was still the same old Mary. Do you have any idea that I spent two hours in makeup and was excited to show you? Dad tried to chime in, but Mary wouldn't give him a sec. We're still. Later you even told them you were over the moon I wouldn't be your girlfriend for much longer. Thus, to intercept that, I had to break up with you first. Oh, my. So my dad was a playboy or something? Lisa and I swapped confused looks, then continued watching the show. My dad was dumbfounded, and then he said in a helpless voice, Oh, Mary, things were not like that. I said that you look the same because you're always as beautiful as the day I met you. And about the other thing... Yeah? Um, I prepared a ring to propose to you, so you'd no longer be my girlfriend, but my wife. What? So they broke up because of an absurd misunderstanding and lost contact since then. Jeez, I thought adults were meant to know what they were doing. It sure didn't seem like it at times. Mary gave Dad an awkward smile, and they said that they could be friends. Then she told him about David and how she was marrying him on the 22nd of December. No! We couldn't let this happen. There had to be another way of getting them together. But that road was full of thorns and spikes, especially when Dad dropped a bombshell. His new girlfriend, Lucy. A few days later, when I was working on my art project, Dad walked into the room with her. Excuse me? She was wearing this super tight bodycon dress and had at least seven layers of makeup on. Ugh. Then she even dared to pick up the photo of me with Mom and smirked. Oh, how nice. I rushed over to her, snatched it out of her hands, and shouted, Keep off my things! I don't like you! She immediately glared at me. But then seeing Dad coming down from upstairs, she suddenly smiled and hugged me while whispering in my ear, You don't, but you have to. Jeez, what a poisonous snake! But worse, when she left, 
Dad had this dumb grin on his face. And then he actually asked if I wanted her to be my new mom. Oh no, she'd hypnotized him for sure. In a rush, I called Lisa to tell her about it. She came up with the idea of asking her mom to join us at the Christmas market this week. Bummer. She refused. Apparently she had too much wedding planning to do. Ugh. And if you're thinking it couldn't get worse, then Dad invited Lucy along. So, Lisa asked her mom to let her stay with me for a few days, so we could teach this Lucy some lessons. May the pranking commence. That morning, Lucy showed up in this fancy light blue dress and ordered Dad to get her a chocolate-covered waffle. What a shame. I accidentally knocked it all over her outfit. Oops! Then a fake fly somehow fell into her hot chocolate. Her eyes almost bulged out of her head when she drank that. <laughs> but she just gave us a cunning smirk, then grabbed Dad's arm and cuddled close to him. Unbelievable! But you know... Diamond cuts diamond. When Dad went to the restroom, with sparkling eyes, I said, Lucy, I really admire a nice person like you. My dad's only a mechanic with $1,500 a month, but you still love him. Um, so this isn't true. He ran his own business. But anyway... No way! He looks rich, though. Oh, he probably was just desperate to catch your attention. He bragged a little bit. And you're proud of that? That's not funny, sweetie. I am out of your dad's league. There's no way I'm putting up with a brat like you for such a poor man. Right at that moment, my dad returned and, no surprises, they broke up. Now she was out of the picture, dad was free to win Mary over, right? We three went home, and I noticed that dad was acting weird. He kept on pacing by the door. Then, when Mary arrived to pick Lisa up, he leapt to open it and blurted out to her, Have you thought any more about... us? She didn't say anything, but I noticed them exchanging these sorry looks. Their love for each other was so obviously real, as they knew each other since they had nothing. <sighs> Yet they weren't doing anything about it. It was already December 20th, meaning there were only two days left till the wedding day. I couldn't let our plan fail like this. I immediately grabbed my phone to call Lisa, but the ringing was next to me. She left her phone at my house. Dang. Then the next morning, I walked by her house to go to school as usual, but no one was home, and she wasn't at school either. Oh my, had they moved to David's already? I told Dad this right away when I got home. He thought for a second and asked me to get in the car ASAP to go to California. So our bumper two-day road trip began. When we reached the wedding venue, it was empty. Oh no, we were too late. Dad looked devastated. So I put my arm around him and started to lead him out of there. But then the receptionist appeared and said, Oh, didn't they let you know either? The wedding's been canceled. Dad's face lit up, and we both raced over to the car and started the long drive back. Oh, it felt like ages in the car, and now it was just two hours until Christmas Eve. The roads were full of beautiful Christmas decorations. I looked through the windows and saw people gathering with their families, while Dad and I were driving nonstop. How sad. We drove straight to Lisa and Mary's, but they were out. So we sat in the freezing cold on their doorstep and waited. Dad dozed off, his head resting on my shoulder. Bless. Then I saw them walking towards us. Oh man, you should have seen their shocked faces. <laughs> I shook Dad awake and he looked over at Mary. She dropped her bags and looked at us astonished. Then Lisa told us the whole story. Turns out, on the way to California... They met two amateur robbers who forced them to get out of the car. Mary immediately pounded them with her handbag, while David ran off and hid behind a tree with Lisa. When the robbers scampered off, Mary told David everything from the bottom of her heart, that although David was wealthy, that was not what she wanted. Instead, she just needed a man who could support and protect her. She'd been flattered by his gestures of love, touched by his persistence, and thought that love could be cultivated. 
but things weren't as simple as that. So they broke up, and the wedding was cancelled. Dad and I were stunned. Then, with eyes prickled with tears, my dad said, Mary, I'm sorry for letting you go, but it's not too late, is it? Right after, he pulled the old ring from that day out of his pocket and got down on one knee and said, Mary, will you marry me? She cried out, Yes! Both Lisa and I were bursting with happiness. So now we both have a mom and a dad, and we're pretty much sisters. Yay! This is the warmest Christmas ever. Can you imagine what it's like to be so pretty that people actually bully you because of it? Most of you are probably thinking that being pretty is an amazing thing, but just wait until you hear my story. I'm Jasmine, and I'm 16 years old, and yep, I am indeed named after Princess Jasmine, because the moment I was born, my dad said I looked exactly like her. So, growing up, I was naturally very pretty, and the older I got, the more the boys chased me. But I was oblivious to this. Just because I was pretty didn't mean I was arrogant about it. In fact, I was a very caring kid. I always liked to help people in my class and really didn't care about the way people looked. I wanted to help everyone. One time in third grade, there were three boys fighting and I went to help them. But to my complete shock, they were fighting over me. Our teacher eventually broke up the fight and had to split them all up and make them sit on the opposite side of the classroom, away from me. I was so shocked. Why would people fight over me? Well, by the time I was in fifth grade, I'd gotten even prettier, and at one point, there were five guys fighting over me. One day, two of those guys, Jack and Tyler, were both running towards me from opposite sides of the playground. I was just standing there watching them come towards me, and I panicked and quickly jumped out of the way. They both ended up bashing into each other and fell over. Honestly, it was so funny. I helped them up, but inside, I was dying of laughter. Most girls would probably love getting attention like that, but it drove me crazy. I just wanted people to like me for who I was, not because I was pretty. Even though I got tons of attention from boys, the girls didn't like me. There was one girl called Mia who hated me so much, she actually bullied me. She would always go out of her way to do horrible things to me. Like this one time where she jumped on me in gym class and broke my right arm. She pretended it was an accident, but I know she deliberately did it. And obviously, I use my right arm for everything. So it was torture. I cried so much because for months, I couldn't write anything. And writing was my most favorite thing in the world. And that wasn't the only horrible encounter with Mia. One time I was at the park with my big brother, and he left me alone on the swings so he could go hang out with his friends. As soon as he was out of sight, I saw Mia heading towards me. She looked angry, and I quickly closed my eyes because I was so scared. I thought she was going to hit me. But suddenly, I heard someone running, and I opened my eyes just in time to see my brother grab her arm to stop her from hitting me. He was protecting me, but then he took it too far. He hit her in the face so hard, he knocked her front tooth out. She was screaming and crying, and my brother just grabbed me and made me run out of the park with him. After that, Mia didn't bother me anymore. I moved up to middle school and never saw her again, but my life didn't get much better. You see, at my new school, the uniforms were so ugly. I went from being the pretty girl to a complete tomboy. We had to wear these red polo shirts with baggy nude pants. Honestly, it was not a good look for me. Sure, I was glad not to be the girl guys were fighting over anymore, but I didn't like feeling ugly in the uniform. Then, when we had the school dance, we were finally allowed to wear whatever we wanted. I decided to wear my favorite little black dress that showed off my curvy body. As soon as I walked through the doors into the dance, all eyes were on me. I couldn't believe how much of a difference my outfit could make. All the guys kept trying to get my attention, but I just wanted to dance. It was such a fun night, but the next day was crazy. I got to class and we had to hand in our essays. 
I went to give mine to the teacher, and when I was walking back to my seat, a girl called Paloa stopped me and said, Jasmine, everyone knows your melons are fake. You had plastic surgery, didn't you? She said it so loud, and everyone started laughing, even my friends. I was so embarrassed and just ran out of there crying. Why would she say something like that? To make matters even worse, when I eventually came back to my desk, I noticed someone had messed with my artwork. I love drawing, especially Dragon Ball characters, and I'd drawn a Goku that morning. Someone had ruined it by drawing fake boobs, and then underneath they'd written, You are so fake. I honestly wanted to run out of there and never go back. People were being so mean. Suddenly, a guy called Peter, who was always quite horrible to me, grabbed the drawing and ripped it up. I didn't understand how people could treat me like this. The rest of my middle school life was pretty much the same. I felt miserable, and I thought, finally, high school would be better. But on my first day, I was sitting alone, and I heard a group of girls whispering about me. They were all really pretty and popular, and I tried to ignore them, but two of them came over to me and sat on either side of me. I felt terrified, but suddenly one of them said, Oh my god, you're so pretty. How come you're eating all alone? You can come sit at our table because you're pretty enough. After my middle school experience, I was so happy that people were being nice to me again. Soon I started hanging out with the pretty girls all the time, and the leader of the group, Ashley, she asked me if I had a boyfriend. And when I told her I didn't, she laughed and said, Don't you worry, we'll find you one. But I didn't want them to find me one, because the more I hung out with them, the more I realized that the guys they liked were total troublemakers, and I wasn't interested in those type of guys at all. After a few weeks of hanging out with them, I realized they were too much. I didn't want to spend my days gossiping and being surrounded by drama. Just because I was a pretty girl didn't mean I had to hang out with the pretty girls. I heard there was a new kid at school, and the girls were all making fun of him for some reason. I didn't like what they were saying about him. And so the next day, I decided to go introduce myself and see if he was okay. Well, I have no idea why people were making fun of him. He was gorgeous. Drop dead gorgeous. But he was so shy, and so I just sat on a table near him and stared at him nonstop. I eventually plucked up the courage to go and introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jasmine, I said. Nice to meet you. Then he said, I'm Chris. Hi. And after that, we got chatting, and I couldn't believe how much we had in common. I could see everyone staring at us chatting, but I didn't care. Chris said he'd worried that no one would want to be his friend, and I told him that I would be. After that, we started hanging out every day, and I quickly fell for him. He was kind of nerdy, but I liked that about him. One day, before Valentine's, he asked me what my favorite candy was. Then on Valentine's Day, he surprised me with flowers, a box of chocolates, and a teddy bear. Then a few days after, he gave me another surprise. He'd ordered all my favorite candy, Skittles, Sour Patch Kids, and Airheads. I was so happy. It was the most romantic thing anyone had ever done for me. And he wasn't interested in me just because I was pretty. He actually cared about me. We started dating soon after that, and then I had my first kiss! It was kind of funny because I'd never kissed anyone before, so I had no idea what I was doing, but it felt nice. And after a while, I really got the hang of it. And now we're so in love! It's been seven months since we started dating, and I never could have imagined my life could be so good now! We're even planning to get married in the future! I know we're still young, but when you know, you know! Hey, I'm Callie. I'm almost 16, but I could live in peace only in the first two years of my child's life, until my little brother, Ethan, came along and ruined everything. I always hoped that that little brat had never been born, and if you're the oldest sibling like I am, then chances are you'll feel the same way as I do. Firstly, his birth meant that my parents barely noticed me anymore. Yeah, I know I was two back then, so I don't actually remember this, but as the years passed by, I saw how it was. I got into trouble for dumb things because I was the oldest, while Ethan got away with everything because he was too young to understand. Ugh, I really hate 
My brother. And I could tell tons of reasons for that. We always fought over the last slice of pizza. When he got it, he'd eat it open-mouthed in front of me. And Mom would smile and say, Ah, oh, my growing boy. But when I got it, Mom would frown at me and say, Callie, don't be greedy. Ugh! He'd sneak into my room and took the plushy bunny my bestie gave me and super glued its ears together. So I took his switch and hid it in the basement. It took him an entire week to find it. Ha! <laughs> in revenge, he smeared chocolate over the back of my pants. I only realized what was going on when other kids started laughing and pointing at me. I had to wear my sweater tied around my waist for the rest of the day, even though it was freezing. So I retaliated by rubbing stinging nettles on his pillow. The next morning, his face was bright red and he couldn't stop itching. It was so funny. It was also a photo shoot day. So much to his protests, a makeup artist spent ages applying makeup on him to cover up the redness. He looked so ridiculous. <laughs> you see, my dad's a politician, so sometimes we have to appear in photo shoots where we look like a loving, harmonious family. Pfft. As if. I could play pretend for the cameras, but in reality, I really just wanted to kick my brother's butt. We just didn't get on at all. He's such a brat. So I guess pranking each other was our coping strategy. I mean, hey, it isn't easy living with someone you hate. Our pranks happen so often that our parents just let us get on with it. However, there is one thing Ethan is terrified of. It all started back when he was eight, and Dad was watching The Walking Dead. Me and Ethan walked into the room just as there was a zoom-in scene in which a zombie was having a feeding frenzy. Being the brave girl, I thought it was interesting and sat down and watched it with Dad. But my bro, being the wuss, he screamed, then ran out of the room, hid under our parents' bed, burst into tears, and refused to move for two hours because he was convinced that at the sight of that zombie, he knew he must be chosen, and zombies were going out to get him. Got Achilles' heel. So not long after that, when he dropped my brand new headphones down the toilet, which made me have to put my hand in to pick it up, I decided to get revenge on him. And luckily for me, Halloween was just around the corner. Perfect. I binge watched makeup tutorials on YouTube and practiced on my friends. Then on Halloween, I turned myself into a seriously scary zombie, hid the video camera in his room, got into his closet, and made grumbling and moaning sounds. When he opened the closet door, I jumped out at him and tackled him to the floor. OMG, he screamed so loudly and he actually peed his pants. And now, all these years later, I still have it on video to torment him with. Ha! But don't be fooled, as my brother was not your average kitty. It wasn't that long ago that he played a prank on me, which made me madder than Misty from Pokemon. So, I had a crush on this boy from school. He was just so sweet and dreamy, and from the cute glances he kept on giving me, I was 100% sure he liked me too. Valentine's Day seemed like the perfect day to express my feelings toward him, so I stayed up until midnight the night before making chocolate for him. I left my chocolates lovingly wrapped and boxed on the side in the kitchen and went to bed. The next day, I grabbed the box and at lunchtime, I handed it to my crush. To my utter dismay when he opened it, Instead of the lovely heart-shaped chocolates I'd spent hours making, there were embarrassing childhood pics of me, including a photo from when I was 12 with a bunch of hideous pimples on my face. One of me as a toddler sleeping with my mouth open and saliva drool on my chin, and one of me as a baby with a bowl of food mush on my head. Then my crush lifted up a note saying, Great chocolate, sis. That sneaky brat. Although my crush kept saying that I looked really cute in those photos and he liked them even more than chocolates, I still wanted to give that brat a hard punch right in his annoying face. Oh God, I'm begging you, please take him away from me. I'll be good. I'll do my homework on time and I'll stop borrowing mom's expensive perfume. Okay, so this may have been my wish, but I never expected that it would come true. It was a normal evening around the dinner table. Ethan was glued to his phone and mom got really annoyed and made him clear up the table. While he was doing that, I saw a message pop up on his phone from someone called Sophie, saying, Okay, I'll see you in the front of the cinema at 8 p.m. I'm looking forward to it, smiley face. What? Ethan had a date? Oh, my sweet little bro. It was payback time for ruining my crush's chocolates. So I stealthily followed Ethan to the cinema. Because the cinema was pretty close to our home, we both walked. 
He cut through the park. Jeez, it was creepy at this time. I swear the trees looked like monsters. Anyway, I saw something light up by my feet. I picked it up. It was Ethan's phone. What an idiot. I was so going to make him work hard to get this back. As I walked out of the park, I saw a black van parked nearby. Suddenly, I heard a scream and saw two giant men trying to drag Ethan toward the back of the van. Ethan was crying and struggling with fierce resistance, but my weak, skinny 14-year-old brother was no rival for those two men. What? How dare they try and kidnap my brother? He might have been the most annoying human on the planet, but he was my annoying little brother. There's no way I was letting this happen. I rushed forward and shouted, Ethan, zombie mode on! My presence startled the two kidnappers, and this made them more intent on dragging him toward the van. When all of a sudden, Ethan bit down hard into the hand of the man who was covering his mouth, just like how zombies always do. Good one, bro. The man wept out and shook his hand. The other man pulled on Ethan's arm, but he managed to scramble to his feet. As the man tried to push him into the van, Ethan sought his opportunity and kicked him right between his legs. Ouch. While this was going on, I called the cops and told them to be quick. Then I saw the jerk with the bitten hand about to grab Ethan again. So I screamed out loud, Ethan, run! He sprinted off into the park and the bitten man followed him. It was exactly a real-life zombie chase. Huh. Suddenly, I felt arms grab me around the waist. Oh no, it was the other guy. He said, I guess you'll have to go too. Before he lifted me up and carried me over to the back of the van. I screamed out and tried hitting and kicking out, but he was too strong. He threw me into the back of the van before he could get in. I smashed the van door and quickly locked the door from the inside to knock him out. Lucky for me, not him, but the guy chasing Ethan was the one who was keeping the key. It was so scary when the kidnapper kept shouting at me outside, but I was even more frightened thinking Ethan could get hurt somewhere out there. Then suddenly I heard his voice. Hey, stop. Did he get caught? I looked out to see the contrary. He was running towards me after two police officials. They were holding their guns to control the guy standing by the van. Ethan was safe and came back for me. I opened the door and jumped into his arms. Oh, let's skip this part. I get goosebumps every time I recall this weepy situation. Me and Ethan followed the cops and saw the other kidnapper handcuffed to a tree, fighting with mosquitoes with his one free arm in the dark. The police told me that during the way heading to the van, Ethan kept on complaining about how slow and unprofessional they were, as they should come to save me first instead. My boy still stubbornly said, I could run myself, but this wimp couldn't. The idiot definitely couldn't have imagined that he has a Wonder Woman big sister like me. <laughs> Our parents rushed into the police department to see us. And yep, weepy part again. Turned out my dad's rival had hired the guy to kidnap Ethan so that they could use him to blackmail my dad. I don't clearly understand the whole situation. Maybe after this I'll watch more political movies. But now, thanks God, we're safe. I may have wished my brother would disappear, but when I actually could have lost him forever, well, I have to admit that it really freaked me out. And it turns out he felt the same way about me too. Crazy, huh? Of course, we still play pranks on each other. We wouldn't be us if we didn't. But I realized something. He might be the most annoying brat ever, but he's still my family. And I love my family so much. However, I'm pretty sure there'll still be times when I hate my annoying little bro. Like right now, while I'm sitting in my room telling you my story, I'm sure I can hear him giggling outside of my door. What's the betting I open it and end up with a bucket of cold water on my head or something? All this may because I have told my mom he has a girlfriend. Tough luck, little bro. There's no way you're getting the better of this pranking queen.